from past time. Or yeah. past time. Ish. Oh, good player. Just leave it on health, right? Fuck it.
Please take your seat, um, uh, Mr. Houston, and I just remind you that you are still bound by the oath that you took yesterday. Thank you. Just before I recommence with uh, Pastor Houston, there's a small housekeeping matter. Uh, there was a, a name mentioned yesterday uh, on the transcript uh, that I seek a non-publication direction with respect to. I'll hand up a draft order for your honour consideration. Copies have been provided to the parties. Yes, I've made that order. Thank you. Pastor Houston, just uh, one, one further matter before I conclude my questions. Um, yesterday you'll recall that I was asking some questions about the, the, the changeover period, if you like, in May of 1999, when your father resigned yes. as uh, Senior Pastor of Sydney Christian Life Centre. Yes. Is, is that right? Yes. Have I got that right? Yes. yes. And you, of course, were the senior pastor at Hills Christian Life Centre at that stage. Yes. And um, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think your evidence yesterday was that you, uh, your father, had been telling you over a period of time that he was thinking about resigning. Histor yeah, historically, he, we had talked about whenever it's time for him that he would like me to take on leadership of the church. Yes. All right. So, um, so do I understand that the process was that? Um, well, certainly you had an expectation of taking over Sydney Christian Life Centre um, when he resigned. Is that right? That was, that was the conversation we'd always had. And, in fact, had, uh, he had also had that conversation with the board of uh, Sydney Christian Life Centre. And he, he recommended to the board that that be adopted? Yes, he? yes. All and right. the board, board were wanting that also. So you had that expectation in that when he did resign, that you would then take yeah, over. Yes, so it wasn't a surprise to me that yes. that happened, uh, yeah. that it was going to happen. What was a big surprise was that it happened so quickly. Yes. Um, and the process um, was, um, well, perhaps you can assist us with it, was the process that effectively your, your um, appointment as the, the senior pastor of Sydney Christian Life Centre was put forward to the board for approval, is that how it yes, worked? Yes, And yours was the only name that was put forward? Yes. And it was put forward by your father, is that right? Yes. Yes, thank you. Those are my questions. Thanks, Mr Beckett. Your Honour, I'm told a message has come through from um, Mr Kernahan that he's running somewhat late and he sends his apologies. Thank you. He'll be here later this morning, I understand. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, uh, Mr. Hewson, my name is Miss McGlinchey and I represent AHA in these proceedings. Uh, Mr. Hewson, it's, it will be necessary for me to take you over some of the evidence you gave yesterday in order for me to frame some questions that are, that are relevant to AHA. Sure. So I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive. That's all right. Uh, I think you said in your evidence yesterday that a family friend took you to the lawyer and you believe the lawyers were Malisons? Yes. Is that the same family friend that attended uh, the meeting with AHA? That is Mr... Yes. Um, Sala. OK. All right. And you've also said that it's, it's possible that the document you saw came out of that meeting. It is possible. I can't say that that is where it came from. Oh. Um, but... Uh, it is certainly possible, but it wasn't like a it, it wasn't like a, a, a legal letter, or it wasn't um, wasn't on anyone's uh, letter here or anything that. like that. It was I just understand. literally a piece of paper with two or three lines of type, two or three paragraphs of typing. I think you said yesterday, three or four paragraphs of typing. Yeah. All right. Um, you did read the document later. Yes, it was passed by me to have a look at. All right. And when you read the document, did it reflect the conversation that you had at the lawyer's office? No. No, it wasn't about that at all. all right. What was the conversation at the lawyer's office? The conversation at the lawyer's office was a broad conversation about Frank's position. Um, 
it, it actually didn't go into the idea of compensation or money or anything like that. It was much more about Frank's position, and uh, um, that's it, really. Right. Uh, but you're, you do say that it's a possibility that it, the document did come out of the lawyer's office? It's possible. All right. You didn't give instructions to the lawyer to draft that document? No. And, in fact... Um, the friend, the family friend, he, he doesn't remember a document. Mr Salah, um, uh, um, did attend the meeting at the lawyer? Yes. All right. OK. Did he have any meetings at the lawyers, as far as you know, <coughs> that you didn't attend? No, he didn't. All right. I would say almost certainly he didn't. All right. You recall that the document had three or four paragraphs, and when you read the document, document and I'm just paraphrasing your, your evidence yesterday... Yes. Um, it was to the effect that we agree to the payment of the money and we agree this amount of money is final. That's what I remember. I can't say for certain that's what it said. To me, that was the, the tenor of what was being signed. Yes, that's was all it? I'm asking you. I don't expect yeah. you to remember word for word of the, the document. And, of course, when you read the document, there were no signatures on it because you said it was pre the meeting. Yes, yes. So when you read the document, it was your expectation that it would be taken to the meeting? I thought it would be, and in fact, I still think maybe it was. All right, OK. Um, and was it also your expectation that it would be shown to AHA and that he would be asked to sign it or asked to consider signing it? That was what I thought would be happening, yeah. You've also said that you didn't think it was appropriate for you to attend the meeting because of the conflict situation? Yes. All right. Was there any consideration about whether it was appropriate for Mr Salah? Am I... Excuse me, am I pronouncing his name correctly? Salah. Salah. OK. Um, was there any consideration of whether it was appropriate for him to attend? Well, he was a family friend. That's the only reason he went... And uh, I don't think that uh, he, he considered that at all. He loved my dad, and I think he just all he was concerned about was looking after my father in terms of driving him there, being there to comfort him. Obviously, you know, for my father, it, it was probably uh, a, a, you know a, a difficult day, and uh, he was just there literally to stand with him. So there was a conversation about that between you, you and Mr. Salah and your dad. No. But there was a conversation between you and Mr Salah about that. To be honest, that I, what I saw was the document, and I'm, yes. you know, I'm just making sure I'm, I'm factual on what I'm saying. I saw the document uh, shown to me by members of my family, and uh, I knew that this meeting was happening. Well, apart from that, I really didn't know too much about it at all. I, all right. As I said yesterday, I thought it happened at a park. I didn't even know it was at McDonald's. I knew it was in that general area, Thornley, but all I right. thought it happened in a park. And I think you said a minute ago that you still think that it might have been signed at the meeting. That's that's what I thought would happen. And, yes, I, I do. I mean, we've heard it was a food stain napkin. I'm not saying it wasn't. It possibly could be. But it wasn't what I thought was going right. to, you know, would happen because I'd seen this piece of paper that would serve no other reason but to be what was signed there. And you uh, had a conversation after the meeting? With? With Mr Salah? I can't even remember. All right. And what about with your dad about the signing of the, the document? No, I can't remember. Right. Now, j just to clarify about Mr Mr Salah, he is, you've said he's your family friend? Yes. Has been a friend for many years? Yes. Friend of your father's for many years? Yes. He's also very involved in the Hillsong Church? Yes. All right. He's a senior elder? Yes. He's a member of, I think you call it, yeah. he's a member of the eldership. He, he was a member of Hill CRC eldership, and of course in those days Sydney CRC was an entirely different church. So my father's church had a different board than Hill CRC had. So he was definitely an elder at Hill CRC. All right. And an elder uh, of Hillsong. Hill CLC. Okay, right. He is also a director on the on the board of Hillsong. Now. Yes. Yes, he is. Was he then? Yes. Right. He is also a member of the audit committee of the board of Hillsong Corporation. Now. Yes. Yes. Was he then? I couldn't say. I don't know whether we even had such a thing then. All right. He's also now a member of the on the 
the committee for remuneration of Hillsong Corporation. Now, yes. yes. All right. You you don't know, remember whether it, there was such a, a committee then? No, I don't think we were quite that organised right. then. So would it be fair to say that he's very involved in the corporate governance of the Hillsong Corporation? Very involved. It hasn't got much relevance to the document, though. All right. Uh, I just want to ask you some questions about the, your conversation with AHA. Yes. Right. Um, you've said in your evidence yesterday that when you read the statement of AHA, you were reminded uh, of some matters which presumably you didn't remember when you were making That's the statement. That's true. As soon as, he, as soon as I saw what he said about the money, I remembered that was true. I'd completely forgotten about that part of the conversation. All right. And to be clear, that is that AHA called you? No, he didn't call me. I called him. All right. And that the conversation was about the $10,000? The $10,000 came into the conversation. The conversation was much bigger than that part of the conversation. He was very frustrated because he, obviously, my father had talked about my father compensated him and he hadn't received the compensation. And when he told me that, I was frustrated as well because I was thinking how ridiculous that no one had followed that through. Yes. And I felt like, um, I felt like, you know, it was, uh, it was, we'd let him down. We'd let AH down, A, 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 H down, A down. Right. When I say we, I mean my family. And as a result of that, you approached uh, a member of your family, and I'm not going to ask who that was, but you approached a member of your family? Yes, I did, and I was like, right. why hasn't this happened? All right, and so you ensured, I think the word was uh, in your evidence yesterday, you ensured that the money was paid. So you yes. followed it up, you made sure it was paid. Well, I didn't have to ensure it as soon as I said that. People realised we've got to send this off, so... You knew that it would happen. Yeah. All right. And do you know how it happened? No, I don't. All right. So do, do you know anything about a personal cheque that was sent to AHA? No, I, I couldn't tell you exactly how the payment happened. All right. As a matter of fact, I actually thought it was 12000 I accept it was 10000 I thought it was 12000 All right. Now, uh, Mr Hewson, um, you made your statement on the 28th of September, your statement to this commission? Sure. All right. And when you first entered the witness box, you confirmed that that statement was true and correct? Yes. You were offered the opportunity to change any matters in your statement? Yes. And you declined to do that? Yes. Why didn't you take the opportunity then to correct your statement on the matter of the telephone call? Well, there's no real reason, no reason whatsoever. Other than the fact that your statement was not correct? That's right. Obviously not correct on that point, but it didn't cross my mind. Could there's you just... no malice in it, let's put it that way. Could you just have a look at your statement at paragraph 32? Sure. Would you like to take it? It's quite a long uh, paragraph. Would you like to just read, read it through? Or? Sure, I'll read it all the way through. that there is no reference in that paragraph to a meeting with Mallisons or any other lawyers? There's no meeting, no mention, right. All right. And do you think, do you think that that was, that it's present in your statement anywhere else? No, it's not, no. All right. And do you, do you not think that it was a relevant matter for this commission to know? <clears throat> it could have been. Look, I can tell you now, there's, there's a multitude of things I could have talked about in this statement. I was given advice that you can't possibly put everything in your statement. All right. But you didn't think that a, a meeting with lawyers where you discussed your father's situation in relation to AHA was relevant to this commission? Where I went as my, as my father's son to go to see a lawyer about my father 
this commission's about institutional child abuse, so in that sense I don't see that it was particularly relevant, but I went to see a lawyer. It's something that was between a father and a son. Could you look at your statement at um, paragraph 37? Sure. Okay. Now, that paragraph is headed up, phone call with AHA, uh -huh. correct? Yes. And I think that the next uh, 37 to 39 all deal with that same subject matter? Right. Okay. <coughs> do you agree? That, do you, would you like to take a minute to read it through? Yes. Is it 39 as well? Um, yes, please. I'll need to see more of 39 then. It's a moment I... Yeah, that's right. right. You agree that you give a very clear statement of what that call was all about. Uh-huh. You talk about no. offering pastoral care, sure. asking him if he needed any help. Sure. You don't refer at all to the mention of the money. No, but I did yesterday. If I... If I if I did yesterday because I, I suddenly recalled it. It was definitely a part of the conversation. Well, you didn't suddenly recall it in the witness box. No, you I recalled it when I read the statement of AHA. All right. Well, let's just... What actions have you taken since you recalled it to correct your incorrect statement well, about well, that yes, telephone call? You the, well, I think the, the fact points, that... Talk, sorry. sorry. Excuse me. You've made the point through this witness. I'm not sure that continuing to make it is going to be of any assistance to us. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, I'll move on. Mr Hooson, can I suggest to you that the matters in your statement that are incorrect, and I will finish with this, Commissioner, relate to arrangements and your involvement in the payment of that money? I wasn't involved in the payment of the money. Except that you asked your family to make that money, the, the payment? After the conversation with AHA? Yes. Yeah, I, I rang and said, hey, you, you uh, haven't, haven't followed this through. Remembering that I'm telling you I'd seen a document beforehand, so it wasn't a surprise to me. Right. Can I suggest to you that the inconsistencies and errors in your statement were deliberate? Why would I admit it? Why would I bring it up here? Mr. Now, I'm just if it was deliberate, to you. if it was deliberate that I was trying to hide something, I mean the truth is I didn't have to talk about it at all. I spoke about it because I'm saying I had a, I, I had completely forgotten this, and now I remember. So I'm telling the commission this is what I remember. Right. I'm suggesting to you that when you made your statement, you tried to hide your knowledge of and involvement of the payment of ten thousand dollars to. Well, the suggestion was wrong. No, I didn't do that. Thank you. Nothing further, Commissioner. Thank you. Mr Koenigan. Thank you. Uh, and just for the Commission's benefit, I think I indicated through Council assisting yesterday I'd be about half an hour. I don't expect that to be the case. I think it'll be shorter than that. Thank you, Mr Koenig. So I wonder if you could have a look, please, at Annexure N to the statement. I'm sorry. My name's Aaron Koenigan, pastor, and I act for Barbara Taylor. Sure. And I wonder if you could... Uh, have a look at the screen, look at Annex N. Mm -hmm. No, Annex N to the statement of Barbara Taylor. N for Nelly, or November. Is that a document that you received on or after the 26th of June 2000? Yes. And it was the case that your response to that document was to ring Pastor Taylor, is that right? Yes. Um, I'd ask you now to look at Annex O. <coughs> oh, this 
This is obviously Pastor Taylor's document, not yours, mm -hmm. but it's a document that you've since seen. Is mm -hmm. that right? It's a document that you've since seen? Yes, I've seen it now, yeah. Uh, can I draw your attention to item number three in that list? You'll appreciate that we understand this document are some notes of the conversation that Barbara Taylor made, her conversation with you on the phone after you would received the letter I've just shown you. Yes, yes. Uh, can you look to number three? Do you recall during the telephone discussion a discussion about the meeting between AHA and Frank Houston with an elder of CLC present? I can't say I recall a lot about that actual phone call at all, to be honest with you. Uh, in, specifically in relation to that topic, do you have any memory? <clears throat> that is number three. I, I couldn't say, to be honest, that I do have a memory that uh, we discussed this at that time. Is that a <coughs> reference to the meeting that we've heard described as uh, occurring at Thornley McDonald's? Yes. Thank you. Um, if I can draw your attention to item number four, mm. is that a fair description of how you were expressing yourself during the conversation? No. You were not hurt by the letter that I've just shown you? No, I think there's possibly a level of frustration that all sorts of incorrect conclusions had been made. Um, in the six months uh, of silence that Pastor Taylor had suffered. Um, so I probably expressed um, my frustration that a lot of her conclusions were built on hearsay and what she had heard from other people rather than just giving me a contact. Is it your explanation that as of this date and at this, the time of this phone call, you and Barbara Taylor were essentially at cross purposes? Do you understand what I mean by that? Well, I know what cross-purposes means. I don't know that her and I were at cross-purposes. Right. Well, that you were both attempting to resolve something, but action had already occurred. Trying to... Resolve the matter, but yeah. action had already occurred. Oh, sorry, I'm not quite following. Right. You accept that at the time of the writing of the letter and this phone call, Barbara Taylor obviously was in the dark about what the response to the AHA yes, allegations were. This. I do accept that she was in the dark, and I would also say, if you don't mind me adding it, that I think that that was uh, unfortunate that Barbara Taylor didn't get better feedback from myself and from others. I think she's a, fantastic, a great old lady and a beautiful pastor and a very honest lady who was doing her very best to try to get to the, to the truth with this, look after her, her uh, nephew. And AOG, then that should be made clear as part of the question. If he's being asked, did he take on the role as the son of Frank Houston, then that should be made clear because I would object on the basis that it's not about an institutional response. Well, 
that, that's my objection. Your, your that's objection, I think, highlights the difficulty question. that Mr Kernigan is endeavouring to explore with Pastor, um, it, it Pastor may, Houston. Uh, but what's not clear... But I'm happy, I'm happy to um, redirect Mr Kernigan. I'm content to do that, Your Honour. Thank you. When you acted in your professional capacity... Mm -hmm. Well, I'll approach it this way then. When you took the lead role you did, if a friend just waits for me to finish the question, when you took the lead role that you did, did you think you were acting as your father's son or as some sort of a role within the organisation of which you were the leader? I think with uh, when my conversations with Barbara, it clearly was in my role as either pastor of Hillsong or, at that time, president of the Assemblies of God. And when you spoke before about the delay in speaking with Mr <coughs> Taylor... Who, who, being other people's delays, you mean? You didn't think that you had a delay... Oh, you mean in this period here, sorry. Between the end of 99 yes. and June 2000, yes, sorry. Did you, you accept that there was a, a delay in you speaking with Barbara Taylor? Yeah. Was that occasion because of your professional work or because of your circumstances as your father's son? I think it had nothing to do with being my father's son. By then, um, by then, it was entirely and all about my professional roles. Do you think, in hindsight, it would have been better if you had totally distanced yourself from the AHA allegations within the church? I think that actually... I uh, am still very pleased that when I found out this information, I went straight to my father, I confronted him, nobody else had, I confronted him, I went through the most horrific meeting of my entire life, I suspended him there and then, I ensured that from that day on he never preached again in his life anywhere, and uh, I feel, I feel... Uh, very confident that I did exactly the right thing. I suggest to you that all the things you just described yourself as doing were not the things that a son can do, but things you did in your professional capacity. And that's what I'm telling you as well. These things related to my professional capacity. And what I'm asking you is, looking back on it, knowing all that you now know, if you think today yes. it would have been better judgment on your part yes. to have an independent person appointed to handle all of those matters. If you're talking about uh, interaction with Barbara Taylor, yes, and some of the other things. If you're talking about interaction with AAJ, I believe that I was being sensitive to his wishes. We've heard over and over here, uh, including from AAJ, he did not want a police investigation. He did not want a church investigation. And we've also heard how to go ahead of a... A, you know, a councillor would tell you if you were to go ahead of a, uh, a victim, someone who's been you know, horribly, horribly uh, treated by a paedophile and start doing things on their behalf they ask you not to do, that you're actually disempowering them. Those are the sorts of things that were in my mind. What about what you did in relation to your father, that meeting that you described in which you suspended him? Yes. Would it have been better if that was handled, not by you, but by an independent person? I believe it was my responsibility. You've given evidence to council assisting, or to the Commission through council assisting questions yesterday about that meeting. Yes. And you've just raised it now, and I want to clarify something. You were acting in your professional capacity during that meeting. Yes. And you don't believe today, looking back on it, that your professional, or your ability to act professionally was compromised by your relationship to your father. No, because I acted very professionally. I followed it through. Did you make I looked him in the eye. I asked him... I asked him if he, uh, if he had done these things. He admitted he had. He, he went into some detail about what that constituted. I told him that what I was going to have to do, that I was going to have to suspend him, that I would be taking it to the national executive. And so I feel quite, uh, quite like I was responsible and I fulfilled my responsibility. Did you make file notes of the conversation? At the time, I probably did, but do I have file notes now? No. Do you remember making any written record of the conversation? No, but I, uh, yeah, I, I, I take notes on it, most conversations I have, so I would have taken scribble notes. 
Uh, but on this particular instance, it's, it's, it's in a life of 60 years, it's not as though it was a small day. So I've got very vivid memories of it. And, and just to be clear, that meeting that you've described with your father in your office, yes. when do you recall it occurring? It, he was, well, we were working even this morning still on trying to ascertain exactly when George first told me about uh, the, the, you know, the allegation. And we still are working that towards the very, very end of October, right through to maybe very first week in November. It's in that date time frame there. So from that point, my father was away three weeks overseas. He came home late, late on a on a week, like on a Friday, uh, I had a huge weekend, and so I did what I had to do that weekend, church-wise, preaching and so on. He, I think that weekend, actually did preach somewhere else, uh, and it may have been Canberra. It was the last time he ever preached in his life. That is the year 1999 that you're referring to? Yes, this is in either... Or this now would be late, nine, late mid to late November, 1999. It wasn't for quite some time, though, that arrangements were made, as I understand your evidence yesterday, it wasn't for quite some time until arrangements were made to clear out your father's office. Is that right? Yeah, he never used that office during that entire 12 months. He was actually attending a church in the Hawkesbury during that time. We had asked him, after this came through, to... Um, to uh, move on from Hillsong Church and he was attending Ian Woods Church in Hawkesbury, uh, to my memory. And so there was an office there. He, he, didn't, he didn't use the office. The only thing he did during that 12 months was probably came to Hillsong Conference. I remember him coming to our men's conference because he was so miserable. Uh, so he came to one or two things like that. This office that he didn't use, yeah. where was it? I don't even know where his office was. I mean, I know the building. This is the office that the arrangements were that your mother was going to clear out. Yes, yes. So it would have been at Sydney Christian Life Centre, and it was the same office that he always had there. I know exactly what room it was. Right. Just returning to the annexure that's on the screen in front of you, you'll see uh, item number 10. Yes. Do you recall giving a direction of that nature to Barbara Taylor during that phone call? Uh, I have a much different recollection of it. What's your recollection of it? My recollection, so this says, any future correspondence to be my phone. So she saw that as me saying, don't write, don't write, in case my staff see it. That's how, she, in my words, she described it. To be honest, my senior staff see every piece of correspondence that comes through my office open everything. My PA has been my PA for 20 years and she knows more about my life just about than I do. So there, there would be no reason why I'd be trying to hide that from my senior staff. The, the tenor of the conversation from my memory is much more like this. She was so frustrated it had taken six months, she had heard nothing and so in that conversation I'm saying, Barbara if you, if you need to talk to me, if you want to talk to me, just give me a call to which she said, well you're a very hard man to contact, to which I said, I will tell Megan, my secretary, my PA, that if you call, that she'll put you straight through. That was the conversation. So it wasn't the case that you were imparting to her a desire on your part not to have anything in writing? Not at all. Did you follow up with Barbara by sending her a short letter confirming your conversation? Uh, probably not. Did you ever write to Barbara on this topic again? On this topic. No, but her and I did have one uh, little conversation about it in 2007. By inviting Barbara to call you as the need arose to discuss this matter, yes. you were still at that time comfortable with dealing with this matter? Yes. In your professional capacity? I still am today. You, you were comfortable then with dealing with Barbara? as the first person within the church, it seemed, that the complaint had been reported to? Well, to be honest, Barbara could have turned to anyone on the national executive. There's nothing stopping her from talking to anyone she wanted. She could have talked to the assistant president. She could have talked to any of the executive members. She already had contact with John McMartin. She could have talked to him. Yeah. Um, so it's not as though she was forced to talk to me. Um, was there then any procedure that you were aware of to assist persons in the position of Barbara Taylor to deal with their own stress 
and anxiety with dealing with these sorts of complaints? Could you please repeat that question? Were you aware of there being any procedure or facility available at the time to help people in the position of Barbara Taylor deal with the difficulties of managing complaints of this kind? I already mentioned I feel like we let Barbara Taylor down. I feel like she deserved far better. I feel like she is, in this instance, I would see her as, as if you like, the hero. She was going for justice and she wasn't going to give up. And uh, eventually she managed to, uh, you know, to bring it to the point where it needed to get. More to the point, probably it was, it was uh, Kevin Mudford that contacted me. But I, I got nothing but respect for Barbara in this whole incident. In saying what you've just said, do you accept, do you, that part of dealing with people like Barbara Taylor fairly and properly is to make sure that they know what the outcome is of the efforts that the organisation undertakes? Well, obviously, Barbara, Barbara wasn't the, uh, the survivor, the victor as such, victims, excuse me, as such. And so I think, you know, obviously she reported some of the level of her frustration and the that 12 month period from 1998 to 1999 that she was, I have, I've only learned that myself since I've been reading all this documentation. I, I wasn't aware just exactly all of the processes that she had been through. Um, I've lost your question, sorry. Yeah. Do you accept that it's important that people in the position of Barbara Taylor yes. be told in a transparent Yes, and I think those areas, everyone in our world would agree, we have already uh, improved our our processes incredibly and our systems and this is one of those things that we have to learn through this commission and through this experience. And does that extend to making sure that the people tasked with dealing with these complaints in senior positions don't have any conflicts of interest? I, I understand what you're saying. Um, the whole idea of a conflict of interest, to be honest, hadn't even occurred to me and was never suggested by anyone else until we got here to the Commission and yesterday the, uh, the Assistant Council began to go along those lines. I, I saw it as me being in a role, having to make tough decisions and, and having the, the guts or the courage to make those tough decisions. Um, this is my last area of question sure. it's on this particular point. At the time that you were dealing with all of these issues, in your professional capacity. You had around you people like Mr Salu. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. You were seeking advice from those people? From our church board in its entirety. So, uh, Which he we... was a part? Pardon? Which he was a part? Absolutely he was a part, yes. Mr Salu but, is a... But, you know, if I could just reaffirm one more time, obviously there's some interest in Mr Salu. Mr Salu, simply a man who drove my father over to a meeting to support him and help him, step with him, uh, organised the processes, however those processes had, drove him back again, and that was the end of it. I'd suggest that he's a bit more than that, if he's advising you and helping you to understand your situation. Now, so if, now we're, we're, we're moving on. I'll now. rephrase the question. No, no, the, my objection is, if I may, there is a conflating of the roles of... Uh, Mr Houston here in my friend's question and his constant reference to the phrase professional capacity. If he's referring to him being the senior pastor of what was then Hills Christian Life Centre and to the extent that it was the Sydney Christian Life Centre, then that should be made implicit rather than using this generic phrase of professional, uh, professional capacity. If, however, my friend is referring to his role as the president of the AOGA, then that should be made apparent because um, well, that should be made apparent. Well, with respect to my friend, that's a distinction that the witness doesn't seem to struggle with. The witness seems to understand his professional capacity and has referred to his professional capacity. It doesn't seem to be a helpful distinction when one talks about a person such as the pastor who has the position that he does with all of its complexities. But I'm happy to make it more precise if that's yes. my friend. Yeah, the, the, the mischief would appear to lie in when the witness refers to it, he refers to the church, of which the AOGA is not, and my friend appears to be referring to something broader. It's, it's the clarity we should seek to strive to achieve. All right. Well, sir, so in what role did you 
discuss any part of the AHA allegations with Mr Saleh? With Mr Saleh, it would be completely in relation to Hillsong Church. Thank you. Or in those days, Hill CLC. And getting advice from him and other elders within the church, that yeah. church I'm talking yeah. about, allowed you to access their considerable experience in yes. corporate governance, didn't it? Yes. And Mr Saleh has considerable experience in corporate governance, doesn't he? He's one of nine. Not just of the church, but of organising and running businesses. Oh, absolutely, general. absolutely, yes. And did you have that sort of a discussion about how best to proceed with those people? With which people, sir? So with Mr Saleh, for example. I don't quite understand what you're saying. Did you seek advice from him on how best to deal with the AHA allegations? He was an, um, an elder of our church. I completely submit to the board and members and eldership of our church on any issues related to anything to do with the church. So there's no doubt in our in our conversations, corporate conversations, in other words, all of us together, that we were talking about this situation. I, I'm not asking you about your submission to the board. I'm asking you, did someone like Mr Saleh, who I understand has amongst his experience to the I present day, this. the CEO I object, of Gloria no, Jeans Worldwide. No, I object to that. Yes, I mean, really, an objection to being nothing taken. but an attempt. Well, it's, it's an attempt at what? Well, Your Honour has ruled. I, I'd submit to Your Honour's ruling. Well, I didn't hear the end part of the objection, <coughs> Mr. Mr Higgins. Your Honour, the other business interests of Mr Saleh do not assist this tribunal. Um, this witness has said he has business experience. The end. Well, I'm not asking that. I'm asking no, if it was of assistance to this witness in his decision-making. He had persons around him with considerable corporate governance experience. He says that he submits to their judgment or their opinion. I'm asking what role the benefit of that information had in the way in which this witness proceeded to deal with allegations against his father. The allegations were dealt with by the Assemblies of God. I'm asking about how you dealt with them. Yes. In, in your capacity within the church. Which church? I completely lost you. I'm sorry, I have no idea where you're going. All right. Well, sir, you've told us that within Hillsong Church, in your professional capacity in Hillsong mm. Church... Um, my, as, as my role as a senior pastor, is that what you mean by yes. professional capacity? Well, that was your job. It is still my job. Thank you. And that was your professional capacity. Uh -huh. Do you understand that now? Has your understanding of that term changed? Uh, I understand where we're going here. When you were doing your job at Hillsong... I do my job at Hillsong. I've been doing the same job 31 years. Thank you. When you were doing that job and dealing with, in that capacity, Allegations against your father by AHA. Right. Jack Wilson didn't exist until 2001. Yes, that's right. Well, in whatever form it was in, you were working in a professional capacity when you dealt with the allegations against your father. I had a role Hillsong. to do in my job, and I, that's the job I was doing, absolutely. Thank you. My role was to confront my father, to address the issues, to suspend them, to take it to the assemblies of God. Uh, and to talk about whatever um, steps that we would take at the Seventh God level, because that's where he was credentialed. Yes. Um, and then uh, to go on and talk about his actual involvement in the church. The truth is he was, he was effectively fired from his role from the day I met him in the office. I understand. And as I've asked you before, to be clear for everyone's benefit, when you had that meeting in the office, you were not there as the son of your father. You were there in your job. Absolutely. And while you were doing those things, you sought advice from the elders that you considered your peers and your colleagues and the people that you worked with. I think you need to understand that at the time that this happened, Nabi Sali was a board member and elder of Hills Christian Life Centre. My father was the pastor of Sydney Christian Life Centre, or former pastor of Sydney Christian Life Centre. So my dealings with Frank at that point 
were not with the Hill CLC board, they were with the Sydney CLC board. So one of the very first things I did after having talked to my father was literally drive to each of those people's homes yes. or business places and tell them individually about the situation with Frank and the action I had taken. Uh, that was the that was my um, my oversight, if you like, on this matter. Yes, but you, you were in consultation with Mr. Sally. Were you? No, I wasn't. You were in consultation with Mr. Sally when you met with your father at Thornley, were you not? Um, to me, what you mean by that? Well, did you talk to him about it? Um, I, I knew he was going to be involved in the meeting. He put his hand up and offered. But there's nothing too much more than uh, than that. Did you go to Mallison's with Mr. Sally? Yes. Thank you. That was as a son, but I don't see what going as a son has any relevance to institutional response to, to child abuse. All right, Mr. Sally, his presence there was not as a family member, was he? He was there as a close family friend. Was he? All right. Should I have chosen a close family friend who didn't work and didn't have a business? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Your Honour, Commissioner. I'll go next. Thank you. Mr Chowdhury, thank you. Uh, Mr Houston, my name's Craig Chowdhury. I act for Australian Christian Churches. Sure. Thank you. Uh, before you spoke to your father, Frank, to confront him about the allegations, yes. do you recall speaking with John McMartin about the allegations? I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I didn't have any conversation with John before I heard the allegation. Right. You've given evidence that the first time you knew was from uh, George, your the manager out at the event, Hills Christian Life, correct? That's, that's correct. Right. I'm asking you, you said there was a three-week period because your father was overseas, correct? Yes. During that three-week period, is it possible that you also spoke to John McMartin about the allegation? Yeah, I think during that time we did, to, we did speak then. Right. All right. Uh, and I just want to see if this refreshes your memory. Uh, were you in shock when uh, John McMartin told you about the allegations? <laughs> no, because I knew about the allegation. I was probably still very pained and uh, very traumatised, but it wasn't a shock because the shock was when I heard it from George Agajanian. All right, thank you. Did you say to Mr McMartin, how do you know if it's true? No, I did not. Uh, do you recall Mr McMartin saying, I don't, but it needs to be investigated? No, I don't. Is it possible that was said? Pardon? Is it possible that was said by Mr McMartin, it needs, I don't know if it's true, but it needs to be investigated? No, I believe it's completely wrong. Thank you. Nothing further. No questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Can tab five be put up on the screen, please? It's the statement of Mr Houston. And when that's done, could it scroll through to paragraph 33, please? to yourself, please. And when you've done that, please tell me. Yes. Um, can I now ask that uh, from tab two, um, a nature K for kilo, please. Go to item three and read that to yourself, please. And when you've done that, please tell me. This is Barbara Taylor's summary, isn't it? Correct. This is Barbara Taylor's notes following a meeting yeah. between yourself, Mr McMartin, sure. and her. Sure. Um, yep. So relevant to the issue of the timing of the standing down of your father or the suspension of your father from ministry, um, at paragraph 33, uh, you tell the commission that he was suspended immediately by you. Yes. But uh, someone else's document records <coughs> you saying 
in what we're to understand is probably the same month, but sometime after, that he would be stood down. What is the correct situation? It, it will, um, the, the, the he would be stood down is a misinterpretation. He was stood down instantly. As a matter of fact, I'll reinforce it again, he never ever preached again anywhere after I confronted him in my office in mid to late November 1999. If I can move then to another point in time. Just bear with me. Uh, you were asked questions by council assisting yesterday about the AHG uh, allegations, the ones arising out of New Zealand. Um, the, the resident here in Australia, who yeah. now, who, and, but it happened in New Zealand, yes. Correct. I was asked some questions about AOGA, AOGNZ. Yes. Um, are they autonomous organisations? They are entirely separate organisations. They uh, have no legal binding whatsoever. Um, different from an organisation such as, say, the Catholic Church or the Anglican Church, they're not international organisations? That's absolutely right. right. So AOGA and AOGNZ, whilst they may share a similar label by their <coughs> country, they um, do not... Uh, they're not governed by an umbrella organisation? No. I, I, I'm hoping I heard what you said right. You were saying they're not governed by the same organisation as the way I said. Yeah, definitely not. They're, as, as you said earlier, autonomous. We're totally autonomous. Um, all right, I'm just going to move to something else, if I may. I'm going to show you this document, please. Can I approach? Uh, you've got a, a document that I you have. want. I have. Um, thank you. I'm sorry. To, to be conveyed, please. Just take the document from Mr Higgins. It's the same one I've given you yesterday. Oh, it's up on the screen. Ah, <coughs> oh, yes, it's up on the screen. Do you need it to be shown to me? Uh, show it to him, but I'm, I'm grateful for it being put on the screen. Thanks. So on the screen, you should have before you uh, an image of I know. the hard copy. Thanks. And can you just tell... Your Honour and Commissioner, what this document is? It's the uh, it's the promotional uh, brochure for the Hillsong Conference for the year 2000. Okay, now, Hillsong, uh, as an incorporated entity, did not exist until 2001? No, in those days, Hillsong only reflected our music and the conference. That was the name of the conference and the name of our music. Right, so prior to 2001, when we... <coughs> hear the word Hillsong, we're not talking about an entity, but we're talking about a con an interdenominational conference yes. uh, where people come together to celebrate Christian religion. Yes. And I'm not sure about the word religion, but... I'll stand corrected. Christian right. faith. faith. <laughs> um, now, this one, by reference to that page on the screen, refers to the 2000 conference said to occur between... Uh, 4th and 7th of July and week 2, 10, 11, 10, 13 July 2000. Yes. How long in advance of the, that conference is this brochure created? It would have been any time between 12 months before the, and, uh, and nine months before. So in July or mid-1999, did Hillsong have a similar conference? Yes, every year. And uh, at that 1999 conference, does Hillsong uh, make available this brochure? Um, I couldn't say with absolute certainty that it was available then. Uh, it possibly was, definitely, because we definitely try to already give people insight into what's going to be happening next year. Uh, I couldn't say authoritatively exactly what date this was. But, but that would have been the time frame. All right. 
Right. So <coughs> certainly, if not available at the preceding conference, it would be available in the weeks or months following yes. the preceding conference yes. in anticipation of the forthcoming conference the next year. Yes. And um, is this the only brochure that Hillsong was creating at that time relevant to uh, the preaching that was uh, available for, for through Hillsong? Yes. Can I ask the council assisting tender that document? Can I indicate what its forensic purpose is? Yes, I'm happy to have the, have the document tendered. 18.0010. Higgins can make submissions, I think, on, the, on that basis. Just can you want to just commission to excuse me, ma'am? Yeah. Some, some matters in re-examination. To the degree to which they're not strictly in re-examination, then um, I won't object to if uh, further application is made. Um, but, sir, I wonder if I could just raise a, a, few, a few short matters before we wind up your evidence. First of all, you recall that um, the first confrontation with your father happened in November of 1999. Excuse me? The first conversation you had with your father yes. about the allegations yes. occurred in November yeah. of 1999. Mid he, to late 1999. He came back from overseas. Yes. You had a meeting with him. You put the allegations to him. Yes. Um, he made uh, some admissions about those allegations. He, yeah, he admitted it. Yes. Um, can I ask you, casting your mind back to that time, what would you have done if he had denied the allegations? We would have just had to put in a, a, a process to um, to uh, get more people involved, I guess. All right. What sort of process would that have been? I couldn't say, really. I mean, I would think that uh, either the Assemblies of God or Hillsong Church, I would have passed it on to other people. The, you know, uh, it, it, I, I can't. Why, why would you have passed it on to other people at that stage? Because I was unsuccessful in getting the information. I knew, I knew, I didn't know the details, but I knew this was going to be true. There was too many, too many links, too many people suggesting too many things for it not to have some, some merit to it. Do I, do I understand what you say, that uh, um, it, it would have been desirable to have other people involved in determining whether the allegations had occurred or not? Yes, if, if I hadn't got that in if I hadn't been successful in hearing that information initially. Um, now, uh, the admissions that your father had made um, at that meeting were the ones that you took through to the National Committee, is that right? Yes. And um, just correct my memory, is a little stretchy on this from yesterday, but um, your father admitted to one act or act on one occasion, I think you said, oh, the one-off. No, I think it was one act, one-off, one-off act, I think you said. Right. And that was the version that was communicated by you to the National Committee, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yes. You didn't say to the National Committee that um, you knew or you thought that there may have been other, other acts apart from the one-off incident? I just relayed what he had told me, that there was one. I really did want to believe him. I don't know that I did deep down in my heart believe him. Yes. And that would have been the spirit with which I went to the National Executive. All right. Um, do you accept now, you've heard AHA's evidence about about that, that there were a number of occasions. Yes. Do you accept what he says, that there was more than one occasion? I, I can easily accept there's more than one occasion. I, You know, I would possibly um, 
have a different version of dates, exactly where and when and, and so on. Obviously, I wasn't there all the time, but I mean, yes. I've got no reason to doubt him. One thing that's not in doubt is that my father has proven to be a paedophile and he badly violated um, AHA's life and did him desperate damage. And uh, for that, I'm just very, very sad. Um, and then, just to finish this line of questioning, um, you're aware that um, certainly a year or so later that there was a f um, an investigation that the, where the National Executive sent pastors Lewis and to, Ainge New, to, to New, New Zealand, Zealand yes. and they were given further allegations yes. in New Zealand that they were substantiated by the New Zealand Executive. Yes. Do, you, do you accept now that uh, your father had abused other children in New Zealand? Uh, no doubt, no. We probably don't know how many. We, we may never know just how far it went. Yes. yes, those are my questions. Thanks, Mr Beckett. Just a couple of matters, um, Pastor, before I excuse you. Um, j just in answer to question, questions that were being put to you then by Mr Beckett, um, I understood you to say when you were asked questions about the truth of the communication that had been made to you by... George, as he's being referred to, that you said you accepted the truth of that yes. uh, information that he conveyed to you. Yes. And in, in answer to the question, you said um, there were too many people and too many links. Can you uh, just explain what, what you meant by that? Uh, look, I can't say, you know, categorically, I knew it was true. I, I wasn't quite saying that. I think I'm saying deep down in my heart, I knew that uh, this was true. Um, because, because AH's mother, who I knew, I don't know, and, and who I know loved our family at that time, there's no reason why she would make up such a story. Um, um, I'm just trying to think about who else at that time. Um, Ke you know, Kevin Mubford, I didn't know well at all. He was something of a maverick. He wasn't actually an ordained pastor or minister. Um, but, you know, between, you know, when, in my experience in life, you get three or four people all saying the same thing. There's usually going to be some sort of truth to it. That's probably what I'm saying. Just one final area I wanted to ask you about, and it relates to the term that's been used throughout the material provided to the Commission and indeed by representatives of the church in evidence about the credentialing of pastors. Yes. So just in general terms, are you able to describe that process for us, for our benefit, how that Sure. Takes place. Sure. Generally, with our uh, Assemblies of God credentialing, um, initially a person is given what's called a PMC, a probationary minister's credential. There's a you know, fairly uh, substantial form that they fill in with references, ask them about theology, ask them about their life, ask them about uh, things that relate to ministry. Uh, and then that form... Uh, with photos goes to the local district. Uh, our, our movement, you know, someone's got its districts, and then it has state, and then it has national executives. So the district processed the forms. They call in the the applic applicant. Uh, they would interview the applicant, and on the basis of that, they would pass on the application to the state with their recommendation. The state would determine who does or doesn't become probationary ministry's credential. Um, now, once you have that, there's a period, certainly when I was involved in 2009, so five years has gone by, but there was a period of uh, proving yourself, which I understand to be a minimum of two years. Uh, so proving yourself in active ministry, your life's pure, you're clean, you're, you know, you're, you're sound, your doctrine's sound, all of those things. And... Um, then eventually you get invited to, to, to apply for ordination. And so that process can happen after two years, but doesn't necessarily happen after two years. It could take three, four, five years. 
and then eventually a person would be invited to apply for ordination and uh, presuming that they uh, had proven themselves well in ministry, they would receive a OMC, an ordained minister's credential. Which comes from where? From the National Executive Assemblies of God. So the National Executive hold uh, the, the, all of the records with respect to credentials? Uh, as far as I know, you would have to ask some of these assemblies have got people here. As far as I know, they do. I do know that the national executive, uh, the authoritative body, every every other executive, the states, the districts first. The districts basically serve the states, and the states serve the the, the national. Now, the national um, I would describe as being the visionaries, the oversight for the entire movement. And I would see the states, this is only my opinion, as um, those who really carry the day-to-day -day looking after of the individual churches and ministries inside that state, uh, answerable to carrying out the wishes of the national executive. So coming, moving now to that period at, <coughs> that's been variously referred to as sometime in late October through to early or mid-November when you have that meeting with your father yeah. and you refer to that, um, amongst other things, what happens at that meeting is that you suspend his credentials. Yes. Um, what role are you performing when you do that? Are you performing that as a... Um, a pastor or as the president of the AOG? President of the Assemblies of God. The, that's the process. The uh, president of the Assemblies of God has the right to, to, to uh, suspend credentials. I think it's up to a period of 30 days, which gives them time to convene a meeting where that matter would be discussed. And uh, no... no um, sorry, I'll start that again. You were and continue to remain unclear about what date it was that that meeting took place. The exact date. We, we can pin it down by a couple of things around the time to a period, a time frame of maybe two weeks. All right. So does it follow that there's no formal document that exists for the suspension of those credentials? Possibly not. Well, when you say possibly not, oh, well, I don't. Um, for, first oh, let me yeah. clarify with sure. you: when credentials are suspended, yes. Firstly, as at 1999, yeah. was there no requirement for that to be um, formalised into a written notice given to the? person whose credentials are suspended? There the possibly is a requirement, and if there is, I, I failed to do so. Uh, I, again, uh, the, president, the current president of the Assembly has got here, and he may be able to clarify that for you, but uh, what I see the role as being practically is informing the person whose credential has been suspended, literally taking the credential from him and informing them that there'll be a meeting within 30 days where the issue of his credential or her credential will be discussed. Do you know whether or not... Um, you, you obviously have no recollection of a formal written document... No, I don't have any rec recollection. ..that, that contained a, a notice of suspension. No, I can't. And, and similarly, a termination document, a termination of credentials. From the Assemblies of God? that existed in 1999? Uh, I, I actually can't answer whether there is or isn't. Again, my colleagues possibly could. And do, uh, do you know the answer to whether or not that exists now? I don't, I don't a, know the answer, a no. a suspension document and a termination document that would be lodged with the national body? Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer. I think you could ask my colleagues and they could give you a, definite, a definitive answer. Uh, to me... I know this is about processes, but to me, in the morality of it, I just knew what I had to do and I followed it through. And uh, when I looked my dad in the eye and he told me that he had molested, that he had sexually abused somebody, 
somebody that I knew, incidentally. Uh, I knew that he would never preach again and that he would not be in active ministry again, and he never was. With, with respect to the, the way in which the Assemblies of God uh, operated at that time, have we understood correctly that uh, once that, that process of credentialing takes place, yes. that um, a pastor or pastors are able then to go and I think the term that you used was plant, um, plant, yeah. plant a church in a community? Our, our jurisdiction is only our, our churches, so our movement, our churches... Mm -hmm. I would think almost definitely if someone was to do that and we knew information about them that uh, was contrary, especially information that related to any form of uh, sexual abuse, I would see it as a moral responsibility and a certainty that we would tell, that we would inform whoever was involved in that, pro that process, this person is not a, uh, a suitable person to be doing this. Is anything arising out of that for... Anyone? No, thank you. No, nothing. All right. No, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Houston. Thank you for your attendance, and you're now excused. Thanks so much. Uh, you're on just a, a note on the, the production of documents. Um, perhaps Mr Chowdhury can assist, but uh, we certainly sought copies of credentials and uh, any formal notification of suspension or um, withdrawal of credentials, whatever the terms. I understand a number of terms have been used, uh, but uh, certainly none have been provided to date to the Royal Commission. Yes, uh, uh, this, certainly we haven't been able to uh, produce any such documents, but inquiries are still being made. Okay. So uh, perhaps um, just the, the inquiry is whether or not a form existed. Correct. Yes. Uh, a, a form of notice of suspension. Yes. Uh, and then secondly, whether or not one was completed yes. with respect to the particular subject matter of this inquiry. I understand that. Thanks, Thank Mr you. Chowdhury. Your Honour, I'm, I'm ready to call the next witness, Pastor McMartin, um, but I'm just wondering whether that was a suitable time for the morning adjournment. So we could take the morning adjournment now and um, perhaps we'll, we'll take 20 minutes. So we'll recommence at... Eleven forty. Sure, please. Stand.
Bueno, entonces. Sounds all set. I called John McMartin. like to take the oath or the affirmation? The oath, thanks. Raise the Bible in your right hand, please, and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. If you just replace the Bible, please, and take a seat right where you are. Pastor, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission, please. John Robert McMahon. And uh, you've provided your address to the Royal Commission? That's correct. And your current occupation is? A minister. And um, you've provided the Royal Commission with a statement dated the 26th of September 2014, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, are there any changes you wish to make to that statement? Yes, I'd like to um, change point number 53. So I'll just have that brought up on the screen. Oh, 54, sorry. 54. Yes, what would you like to change? I'd just like to change that I... When I found out the perpetrator's name was Frank Houston, in that same conversation, I wasn't given the name of AHA. mentioned there in the first line and also about one, two, three, four, five down. All right, so you're saying that... the identity of AHA was not revealed to you on any of the occasions mentioned in that statement? Correct. In that paragraph, is that correct? correct? Yes. Yep. Are there any other changes you wish to make? No, that's it, thank you. Um, I tender the statement. Exhibit 18.0011. Uh, Pastor McMartin, you're currently the state president of the, uh, of the Australian Christian Churches, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, in uh, 1999, um, what position, if any, did you hold within the Assemblies of God? <coughs> I was a state executive member. And um, did you also minister at a particular church then? Yes. Which church was that? Liverpool Christian Life Centre. All right. And today, do you still minister at that, at that same church? Same church, but we changed the name to Inspire Church. Inspire Church. Correct. And I understand you've served in the role of um, the national... Pre sorry, I withdraw that. You've served in the role of the New South Wales president of the ACC since October 2008. Correct. Now, I'm going to ask you um, some questions split into two parts. First of all, we're going to deal with some of the issues surrounding the, deal, the way in which the uh, Assemblies of God, Hillsong Church uh, and uh, Brian Houston dealt with the allegations made by AHA. And then I want to come to some questions about the, the current policies and procedures at the ACC today. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. Um, <coughs> Now, you, now that um, you've heard uh, Pastor Barbara Taylor's evidence that's been given at the Royal Commission, yes, and have you read her statement as well? Yes. Um, and she she says that she had a meeting with you and um, Kevin Mudford on the fourth of November, nineteen ninety eight. Do you recall that meeting at all? No, I don't. Um, do you recall any detail? about any such meeting concerning AHA and his allegations in just, November? Sorry. Just when you read through the documents, I saw that a meeting did have... We, we did have a meeting. I probably have no reason to doubt that, that meeting happened. Um, but the whole content of the conversation, I'm unsure. All right. So you don't doubt that the meeting took place, is that right? Yeah. Um, 
do you recall today knowing in 1998 that there were some allegations about a senior pastor within the Assemblies of God? Correct. And um, do you recall receiving that information from Barbara Taylor or from somebody else? In 1998, I didn't receive that information. <clears throat> I received it later in 1999. All right. Um, there are two ways in which the information seems to have been conveyed. First of all, um, the, the that there were allegations of child sexual abuse against a senior pastor. Correct. That's what um, Pastor Taylor has said. And then secondly, that there were allegations by an identified person, AHA, against Frank Houston. Do you understand that? Say that again. Yes. So the first set of allegations that came forward <coughs> were not identified either as to complainant or alleged perpetrator. Do you understand that? Yes. yes. And then at some later stage, the identity of the complainant and the perpetrator became known. The identity of the perpetrator became known to me. Yes, all right. Well, I'll, I'll go through that yeah. at least. Um, so do you accept now that um, in... November 1998, that there was a meeting between you, Barbara Taylor, and Kevin Mudford at which allegations against of child sexual abuse against the senior pastor were put to you. Do you accept That's that? That's correct. Yes. And uh, we've seen no evidence of anything being done at the state level or the national level at that stage. Can it's you assist us with what sure. steps, if any, were taken? Sure. If, at that time in 1998. Yeah, I'm hearing. The, the, the format that I take when someone comes with a complaint is always put it in writing and present it. Then we can move it forward. All right. And in my conversations with Barbara, and I honour the lady and appreciate her bringing this forward, but there was always a reluctance to say who the perpetrator was. Yes. Even though I pushed but uh, it wasn't forthcoming. That was my dilemma and my frustration. When you say, well, um, do you recall pushing, as you say, and pushing Barbara Talia to inform you about the identity of the complainant and the perpetrator? Well, my feeling was, and we're being honest, is why tell me if you're not going to tell me who? Because it leaves me in a dilemma of yes. I know this, but I don't know who. Did you... Um, did you suggest to Pastor Taylor that uh, um, if... Um, sorry, I withdraw that. Did you suggest to Barbara Taylor that you could write a letter which she could pass on to the complainant setting out what the process was within the Assemblies of God to deal with such allegations? No, I didn't suggest that, but I made it clear to her of what the process was. And I was relying on her to pass that information on. Um, now, Pastor Taylor says, uh, certainly we know by the 19th of May that it appears that you had suggested to her that the matter be taken to Pastor Brian Houston. Was that in May? I'll go to the document. The next F to Barbara Taylor's statement could come up. This is, uh, it's been retyped for, uh, for clarity because the original is poor. This, excuse me, what was that date? Just scroll it down a bit. Yes, yeah, so if we just go up. Oh, 19th of May, 1999. I can show you the original, but the copy is quite poor. Would you like to see the original? That's fine. Now, in this letter, she says, referring to an earlier conversation between you and her, that she and Kevin Mudford go to Brian Houston. Yeah. But we said we did not feel we could do that. You see that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. All right. <coughs> so it appears that at least you suggested that the matter be taken up with the National President of the Assemblies of God at that stage. Yeah. This was step two of the frustration, is that the name of the perpetrator wasn't coming forward. Yes. So my reflection to her would have been, if you don't trust me with the name, take it to a higher level. Did you write to her, did you provide any letter to her to convey to the complainant to explain that to him? No, I didn't. All right. 
Um, Because all this started, even though my role in here was dual, she came to me because um, Mr. Mumford apparently was in our church, so he wanted to come and speak to me, so it started off pastoral, and then it kind of gets collared in from pastoral to state role. Now we know that by September, sorry, I withdraw that, in September of 1999, if an extra G could come up, (coughs) no doubt you've uh, read this letter recently, it's one, sorry, that's it's the one to AHA, I apologise, if um, an extra H could come up, please. You see, this is a letter to John, and um, certainly Pastor Taylor said that this was addressed to you. Yes. You're aware of this letter, are you not? I did I did not receive this letter. I had the conversation with her, but I never, ever remember receiving this letter. All right. Now, there's a reference in that first paragraph to um, um, you receiving her, that is, having a meeting with her... That's correct. ...on the 16th of September. So you don't doubt that that took place? That meeting took place, yes. And... Um, or thereabouts, yeah. Um, do you also accept that in that meeting that she revealed to you the name of, first of all, the perpetrator? In my recollection, she spoke about the perpetrator of... I, I don't remember the um, victim's name. Um, or, you, or his name coming up. Well, do you, do you accept today, based on, based on this letter, that on the 16th of September, whether by whether at a meeting or whether in this letter you received the identity of both the complainant and of the alleged perpetrator? No, my memory has is that all that I can remember is the perpetrator. I have no memory of the uh, abuse victim. Um. Now, certainly you understood... I knew, it was a, um, I knew it was a child that was molested, but I never remember a name. never don't remember the name coming forward. And um, you... So then, as I understand it, um, I think the next step you took... Well, sorry, I should ask you, what next step did you take after you received information about uh, the perpetrator? Mm-hmm. I went back to the process in, if you want to take this forward, we need a written statement. Who did you say that to? To Barbara. And And uh, she was to pass that on to the victim. Did you write to the victim at all? No, I didn't. Um, Do I take it then that um, you didn't receive some form of written complaint from AHA or from anybody? Is that right? Yeah, no written complaint at all. And so as a, as a result of that, you didn't commence the process under the administration manual? That's true. I was waiting, I was waiting for that confirmation in writing. And you knew at that stage that, um, that, that allegations had been made against the senior pastor within the Assemblies of God movement? Is that right? Through this conversation? Yes. The 16th? Yes, correct. Yes. And you knew that the allegations were of child sexual abuse? Correct. Um, and you knew that child sexual abuse is and was at the time of the offence um, a criminal offence? Correct. And you took no steps to commence the, the procedure under the administration manual <coughs> to handle such allegations of abuse? Yes, I did take steps. I asked for a written statement Yes. Of where you're there. That is our first step. So were you were you really content not to take any further step, given that such serious allegations had come forward of a criminal offence involving a child? No, I was, I was very concerned for the victim. I was very concerned that this issue be resolved. My frustration, again, looking the way we process things, is we need a written complaint. So it... it uh, 
Um, it appears that you were caught in a, in a bureaucratic fix at that point, from what you're saying. Was it a bureaucratic fix? I, I sat on it waiting, and then if you want to roll the, the scenario forward a, a bit more, I spoke to Wayne Alcorn because, hey, this is sitting here, I need to get some answers, what should I do? And that's where he recommended I go and speak to Brian, Pastor Brian Houston. Why at that stage did you not have a state officer, somebody on the state executive, as per the administration manual, appointed to go and interview, for example, the complainant? The complainant always wants to stay anonymous. And even in this statement on September the um, 16th, you will notice there, if you want to look at one of the paragraphs down the lower area, it says, I will convey, convey, the, convey this to AHA and ask him if he wants to pursue the matter further. So we're, we're always stuck in this bind of, you know, how do we take this forward? Well, by this stage, it wasn't entirely confidential, was it? That is to say, certainly Barbara Taylor knew that what the allegations were, yeah. and you understood that. And you understood that Kevin Mudford knew what the allegations were. Correct. Now, you knew what the allegations were. I knew there was child abuse. I didn't know the details. So there were three is... people in the Assemblies of God movement, generally, who were aware of the particular matter. Yes. And yet you're saying that you needed some form of written complaint from the complainant to take the matter forward. Correct. And so were you happy in your own mind to leave those allegations hanging <coughs> over a senior pastor of the church I will, I will. while you waited for the formal notification of the complaint from AHA? I wasn't happy at all. But, you know, I just acted on what I knew at the time. So you took the matter to... Um, Pastor Wayne Al Alcorn, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And he determined, I think you said, to take the matter to Brian Houston, is that That's right? correct. You see in paragraph 55 exactly what you've just said there. Can we bring the statement up, please? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Pastor Alcon and I discussed the matter and decided that the National Executive President, Brian Houston, needed to be advised of the allegation. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then in the last sentence of that paragraph, you say, I am unaware as to who made that decision to refer the matter to the National Executive. Do you see that? Yes. Um, is, are you able to assist us with the apparent contradiction between those two matters? Explain the question. Well, um, Pastor Brian Hewson was uh, the national president and a member of the national executive, wasn't he? That's true. And it appears that uh, Pastor Alcorn had made the decision to refer it to him. OK. Uh, is there... Are you saying, making a distinction there in that last sentence between the national president and the national executive? No, it's probably badly written. Is In my understanding, uh, I told Pastor Wayne he was part of the national executive. And because it was uh, Frank Houston, um, Pastor Wayne advised me to speak to Brian Houston because he was the Australian president of the AOG. All right. Now, by, by the, the stage that you've reached uh, with uh, Pastor Alcorn, um, you were aware of allegations that have been passed on to you from Barbara Taylor and from Kevin Mudford, weren't you? Oh, yes. Yep. Yes. That was in All September. Right. And you knew the identity of the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator? I should Correct. Say. Why didn't you um, have appropriate people within the state executive <coughs> allocated, including yourself, to interview, interview Frank Houston about those allegations? It's a good point. 
the for me, going back to then, the reason why we felt we couldn't move on this, we were waiting for a written statement. So the whole process just didn't start really under the administration manual until you had that. Is yeah. that correct? And so again, you were content to have Frank Houston having those allegations hanging over his head and not go through the process under the administration manual. Yeah, I'm hearing what you're saying, but the, the to be content is a bit of a strong word. It was a frustrating time waiting for us to kickstart the process that we can make this happen. Well, the easiest way in which to deal with it was to appoint an independent committee of some sort to look <coughs> to consider the allegations and um, take um, take Frank Houston's evidence about that. Don't you agree? That would probably be correct now, yes. Now, after, after you, speak, you spoke with um, Wayne Alcorn, you, what was the next step in your recollection of what occurred? After I spoke to Pastor Wayne, I made it my effort to contact Pastor Houston. Um, I don't know what the gap was there, but I, I think I spoke to Pastor Wayne probably end of October, and I'm pretty sure... Timelines are a bit uh, sketchy, but I'm pretty sure it was about the second week of November that I called Pastor Houston. And um, you spoke to him on the phone, or did you meet with him in, in person? I spoke to him on the phone. All right. And is that the conversation that you said out of paragraph 57 of your statement will come up? So you scroll down. <coughs> Do you see that? Yes, correct. Um, you say he was in shock, and then he said to you, how do you know if it's true? Do you see that? Yep. And that's your, your recollection of the uh, conversation? That's correct, yes. All right. So did you take maybe, it... Maybe he was in shock, maybe a, a bit drama, but he was definitely taken back. Shock was it. And then you said it needs to be investigated. That's correct. Did you suggest at that time that an independent committee should be established to undertake that investigation? No. Why not? The reason why I said it needs to be investigated, again, we're still waiting for this written complaint to come through. Well, it's, it's more than that, though. You had a complaint. It was a serious complaint, was it? From the complainant. Well, you had a complaint that had been provided through Barbara Taylor in her letter of the 16th of September, hadn't yeah. you? And I didn't um, receive the letter, though we had the conversation. All right. Yep. But in any event, Parsi Houston expressed to you that there was uh, some doubt in his mind as to whether the allegation was true or not. Is that how you took it? No, not at all. I, I think it, it, when, um, when I told him and I've heard the evidence, he may have been told before I told him, and um, <laughs> I, I just think it was, oh, no. That's, that's what I was feeling. But he wanted to know, he's, this is what you say he said, that he wanted to know if it was true or not. Yeah, and what the spirit of that was, not doubting is... Have well, we, sir, have I'll, we I'll, just, I'll just stop you there. I want, uh, uh, it, won't assist for you, it won't assist the Royal Commission if you try and put words into Pastor Houston's mouth yeah, okay. or to in, interpret what he said. Okay. It will assist the Commission if you tell us what he said. In terms. Okay. So He's, he said, "How do you know it's if it's true?" And and you responded by indicating that it needed to be investigated. Correct. Is that right? Yeah. What in your mind, or sorry, I withdraw that. What did you say to him about the process for investigation? I didn't say. All right. Why not? Why not? Why not? Yes. Well, he was the uh, national president and would get into the hands of the, the national executive and they would uh, do their own investigation. Um, there was a process under the administration manual for such investigations to take place, wasn't there? I think so. But um, do I take it from that that you did not suggest to him that that process be adopted? No. Um, and then at 59... Could I just... Ask another question? Oh, no, it's fine. Keep going. 59. 
Paragraph 59 is a, a meeting that, um, would you agree now, on the basis of Barbara Taylor's notes, took place on the 28th of November 1999? Not too sure of the date. 28th of November 1999 is a Sunday. But um, I'm pretty sure it probably happened on a Saturday, maybe the 27th. All right, I have it brought up so yeah. that you have it in front of you. It's um, an extra K to Barbara Taylor's statement. Uh, now, I'll just have you read through that. And this was the first meeting that you'd had with Brian Houston about the allegations against his father? That's correct. And you'll see there at the first point it refers to uh, Frank Houston confessing to a lesser incident than the yeah. truthful one, mm -hmm. but it was further than, I, than Barbara Taylor had been able to get. Do you see that comment there? Yeah. Um, now, what was the incident that Frank Houston was said to have confessed to? I can't remember all the details of this meeting except that I know that we had it and um, so I, I don't know what he confessed to. All right. Do you recall what Brian, what, um, Brian Houston had said about any confession by Frank Houston? No, I can't. Do you remember... Um, so I'll withdraw that. Did you form an opinion as to whether Brian Houston had... Um, suspended his father by the time of this meeting? Or was that to come? No, I think this was, a, 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 as you see, there was at the end of November, I, I think um, Frank Houston was still coming back from overseas. All right. I think. So, to so your... it either happened just after that. All right. I'd say. You see, it's um, couched in the terms of his father would be stood down from preaching. Yeah. On the face of it, it seems to indicate that the act of suspension had not occurred yeah. at that stage. Yeah, that's would be true. Um, now, just returning to your paragraph 59. <coughs> you say you recall you had a meeting between Pastor Brian Houston and Pastor Taylor. Church shortly thereafter. Is that, uh, do you think, the same meeting that's uh, recounted in Pastor Taylor's note I've just taken you to? You're speaking about 59? Yes, it's 59 and, the same, and the 28th, same meeting. And, and the, the 28th, 28th of November. The same meeting. Yep, we same. only had one meeting. Thank you. Uh, now, you say in there that it was an informal meeting between the three of you and you were trying to ascertain the facts of the matter as we were unsure of the le legitimacy of the allegation. Um, so what do you mean by that, the, le the legitimacy of the allegation? Again, we go back to our protocol and our system is a written time, place where the incident took place. So that's what we're looking for. And... Um, Legitimacy seems to indicate, by the use of that word, whether the allegation was a real allegation or some something less, or perhaps a slur on Frank Houston's character. Probably an unfortunate word, but I was pretty convinced that this was a legitimate allegation, but we needed it to be proved with paperwork. So now I want to ask you some questions about the... Oh, sorry, I should conclude that. Um, <clears throat> so I take it from uh, paragraph 60 that that was the end of your, your involvement uh, in the particular matter? That's correct, yeah. Um, and just to confirm, no steps were taken under the administration manual up until the special executive meeting of 22nd of December 1999 
to set up a process uh, under the complaints process there to deal with this particular matter? Under our policy, if a, a prominent pastor transgresses, we have a right to, not a right, we can take it straight to the national executive and they'll deal with it. Yes. And your understanding of what had happened is that it was in the hands of Brian Houston? And the national executive. And the national executive. Had you had any other conversations with members of the national executive apart from Pastor Alcorn? Um, no, just two members, prior Pastor to the Houston and Pastor Alcorn. All right. And um, had Pastor Houston indicated to you whether he had taken control of the, the response to the allegations? Yes. Um, what was the role of the national executive, if any, in that response? Um, basically, my response, my recollection is that uh, Pastor Houston said he would deal with it with the national executive. All right, and then that was the end of your involvement in, in the response. Yeah. Sir, so I want to now take you to some of the New South Wales policies. Okay. Um, and um, what I'm particularly focused on asking you is the interaction between the New South Wales Australian Christian Churches and its affiliated churches underneath it. Sure. So perhaps in, in general form, um, <clears throat> in terms of child protection policy and procedures, um, we've been provided with a number of, uh, in fact, a large number of documents that, sure. that reflect the ACC's current procedures um, for child protection policy and proceed for child protection. Now, am I right in saying that the ACC just itself, without referring to its affiliate churches, the ACC itself has some but a limited role of engaging with children. Is that correct? The ACC... Yes, what, what, are, you, what are you trying to ask? Let, let, me, let me wind back. Mm -hmm. um, wh where is the ACC in New South Wales located? The office? Yes. In um, Borkham Hills. And um, how many people... North West Boulevard, sorry. Yeah. How many people work in that uh, office? There's uh, two. Two people? Yeah. And um, the, that office itself does not run any programs that affect children directly? No, we have a department called Kids Are Us that runs the kids department. All right. And what's, what's, what does that department do? Um, it runs a conference... It uh, creates programs and trains um, children's workers in s safe children's practices. All right. Um, this, this year they've trained just on 700 in our churches. I see. Thank you. Um, now... It's called Safe Places, I think it is. How many affiliated churches are there in New South Wales with the ACC? Approximately 340. All right. And um, the policies and procedures that have been adopted by the ACC in New South Wales, do they apply to all of the churches underneath? Yes. Um, and what is that mechanism? And what I mean by that, are they adopted by those individual churches or is there a mechanism whereby the state executive adopts a policy and it then applies to all affiliated churches? We, we adopt the policy and ratify the policy, then it's sent out to all the individual churches who are to ratify that at a board level and make it part of their culture and their practice. Um, if a individual church does not adopt those policies or procedures, what happens? Well, they'll get a visit from us. What does that mean? We'll just go and check and just see how their policies are. And usually you, you see when a problem comes up is are they following that procedure? Well, a couple of things. We're in constant communication with, not constant, but we're in regular communication with them regarding the importance of governance and policies. And even a conference we had this week in Port Macquarie, again, we were speaking about the importance of having your policies in place and your governance yes. to create what? safe environments for people. 
One, one of the things that's been emphasised um, to the Royal Commission as part of this case study has been the independence of individual churches sure. from the Assemblies of God and now from the ACC. Yeah. And that's still the situation, is it not, that that's there true. is a high degree of independence yeah. of local churches? We're a churches. fellowship of individual churches. Yes. Now, you're unable, for example, as the ACC, to order a particular church to adopt a specific policy? We recommend best practice and we strongly encourage them to adopt our policies and operate their churches in a safe way that creates a best practice for the people in their congregations. What, um, you've mentioned recently just a, a meeting up at Port Macquarie um, was that a, a state conference of the ACC? Correct. And um, what other steps are taken by the ACC New South Wales to ensure the application of um, the ACC's policies across the 300 or so churches affiliated with it? Yeah, it's a fair question. Is what we... We e email them out from our state office and then they're followed through by our regional leaders. We have 15 regions that separate the churches into workable units. So there's about 10 or 12 churches, maybe some are bigger in, in regions. Then the regional leader spends time with the pastor and going through making sure governance is followed. And uh, how frequently... Plus we have workshops during the year. Yep. All right. And how frequently does that, that process that you've just described, not the workshops but the other ones? They'd meet with probably three or four times a year. All right. And is child protection policy one of those matters that is considered at that time? That would... It could be, but our children's department would be working on another uh, level to make sure that happened as well. All right. And what do you think your success rate is, if you like, in terms of implementation of the child protection and policy uh, of the ACC in New South Wales? I think us stating the urgency and the importance of these policies has um, greatly enhanced people's or pastors' um, ability to get this happening. Like I said, we just so far this year we've trained just on 700 leaders in safe place practices. All right. I'll just show you briefly some of these policies, so if you could help by identifying them. If tab uh, 37 of the Policies and Procedure Bundle comes up, um, <clears throat> there's reference to this document in, in a large number of the other documents. Mm. It's a document entitled Child Safe and Child Friendly Policy 2008 to 2011. Correct. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and this is a, a one-page brochure that I presume summarises the, the policies and procedures. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. And on that first page, it's a brochure, so in fact the last page is the column in, in right in the centre of the screen. Is that correct? <clears throat> Which one do you want me to read? Just uh, in the middle column there, you'll say our policy is supported by and okay. then yep. those matters there. A ministerial code of conduct, a code of good ministry practice and so forth, yep. down to response to complaint guidelines. Do you see that? Yep. So this brochure summarises, or at least is an introduction to, a whole suite of policies that the ACC New South Wales has. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Now, we've asked a, a, a number of times through um, those assisting me for a copy of the ACC New South Wales response to complaint guidelines right. with, without success. That's true. Okay. Are you able to assist us as to providing that document or sure. explaining why we were unable to get a copy of it? I'm, I'm sorry that you haven't been able to uh, source that, but it's it's definitely available. I don't know why it hasn't come through. All right. Um, how, would, how would I get that to you? We've, we've had a look on the website. Well, through, you, through your solicitors, right. you, we would be um, assisted, I think if we could have a copy of that particular document. Okay. Can we right. take note of that? Now, one, one thing, one copy, one... Sorry, I withdraw that. One policy... Sorry, if I could just interrupt. 
Uh, I'm instructed that we gave that document to the Commission this morning. It may not have reached Mr Beckett. Was it given in hard copy, Mr Chowdhury, or...? or email. Emailed. We received, we received two documents that we already had and which are contained in the... In the, in the that are already contained in the tender bundle, neither of which meets the description of the ACC New South Wales response to complaint guidelines. Um, perhaps Mr Chowdhury's uh, instructing solicitor can assist Mr Camperiale to, uh, to sort that, that Thank matter you. out rather than... That will be done. There was an explanation in the covering email, but the two can sort it out. Thank you. Uh, one thing that the, that brochure that you have in front of you yes. does not include is mention of a, a document called the 2005 edition of the Child Protection Policy and Procedures. Are you aware of that document? Yes. That's I'll just have it brought up, tab 36 of the Policies and Procedures. What I wanted to ask, it's also not mentioned in your statement, is this the policy that still applies with respect to child protection policy? Could, could that be rolled up a little bit more? Yeah, I'll just have a hard copy shown to you. I'm pretty sure this has been in the process of being upgraded. I'm not sure. I'm just having a, a hard copy of um, that. You'll find it at tab 36 of that volume. This is the one we use now. Excuse me. I think this is the one we use. Is that what you're asking? Thank you. Yeah. And um, so it still has ongoing uh, application to child protection. Is sure. that right? Yep. All right. Now, I wonder if you, if um, certainly for the screen, if we could have um, ringtail 1022 or page 17 of the document you have in front of you, Pastor McMartin brought up. Scroll down a bit further, please, to where it says G. <clears throat> now, are you familiar with this? Oh, I've gone too far. Um, are you sufficiently familiar with this document that I can ask you questions about? Uh... I've read it through a few times, but word for word, yes. no. All right, now... As a general proposition, much of the much of the child protection policies govern issues concerning current children, that is, abuse of current children and the mandatory reporting guidelines in New South Wales, yes. with reporting to the now the Department of Family and Community Services. You, you'd agree with that? Yep. Yes. So I want to ask you about um, how the way in which um, people who are adults now who are abused by children are dealt with under the, the current policy. Do you understand that? I understand what you're saying. All right. Now, the nearest I can get is G, which refers to victims who are now 16 years of age or over. Do you see that? Yes, correct. And um, you're probably aware that there's the position under the child protection, child um Child and Young Persons Protection Act in New South Wales, I hope I've got the title correct, is that with a 16-year-old, you may report the matter to DOCS, but you should seek the permission of the 16- or 17-year-old. Yes. But I want to ask you about, say, for example, an 18-year-old that came forward today with a complaint of child sexual abuse from some years earlier. Do you understand that? Is this the process that would be adopted... Um, by the ACC New South Wales in, in that circumstance? What we would what we'd operate on is what that document states. 
All right, so that a report would be made directly to the State Police Department? Yes. And then if Does we... it say you need to report it to the police? Or the, <coughs> the victim's got to be okay with that? Well, it doesn't seem to say specifically about that. It just says a report should be made directly to the State Police Department. I see that, yes, correct. To your, to your understanding, is the, the current way it operates is that the permission of the child is sought first? Question again. Is your understanding of the way in which this policy works that the permission of the child is required first before a report to the police is made? I, uh, if we're going to make a decision on this, we go back to the document and then, then we read it, then we apply it, and then we do what we need to do. Okay. To protect the victim. So, does. does uh, well, can you ask my. Are you able to assist? Um, by answering my question, that is to say, is the way in which this policy operates one in which the permission of the child is sought first before going to the police department? And I make, uh, I'm not trying to be critical of you, I'm just trying to understand what the policy says <coughs> and how it works. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to work out what you're saying, sorry. But this must be in a phased out po uh, patch at the moment. Okay. So do, you, do you understand what I'm asking? If they're under 16 years of age... No, I'm talking... I'm asking you about the position of over 16 years of age, particularly adults. If, if it says in the document we need to, we will do it. I just don't see it there in the document. Do you? What, does, what does that mean, need to? What are the circumstances so, in which you would abuse, need to report to the police? If they reached the age of 16, we're no longer, no longer the province of DOC. So I'd be asking, OK, they're over 16, who do we report this to now? All right. Would you report all matters of child sexual abuse um, communicated to you by an adult to the police then? <clears throat> I would now. And is that the policy of the ACC New South Wales now? It's there, yep. All right. And um, I think if we go over to the next page... I'm sorry, if we could scroll back to the top of that page, please. And stop. Um, you'll see that there's um, in in the middle of the page there ongoing care and support to be pro provided to the victim. Do you see that? I do. Yes. And um, other steps taken, such as removing the alleged perpetrator from a position of any risk that he or she might pose to children. Correct. Um, support and counselling for the victim. Yep. And then, if the alleged abuse is confirmed by investigation, the perpetrator should face the full implications of his or her actions. Do you see that? Yep. Correct. <clears throat> All right. Now, I just want to ask you about... The, that's the point I've reached in terms of my analysis, at least, of the, of the policies and procedures, is a question mark as to how that investigation takes place. Right. So I, I, I'll just give you some parameters, first of all. Okay. I'm not asking you about pastors because it seems to be clear that the administration manual from the national side um, kicks in and there's a, a, a detailed process known as the grievance procedure yep. which deals with that matter. Do you understand that? Yep. So I'm asking you about non-pastors, non volunteers, pastor. non-credential pastors, yep. members, volunteers within... Um, ACC churches. Do you understand that? Yeah. Um, a mat where a matter has been referred to the police and those investigations are concluded, what's the process that occurs after the end of the police and prosecution process? For the... For the church. Abused or the perpetrator? For both. OK. For the, the uh, abused, we will care for them as much as we can. And... Um, offer them counselling, offer them help, 
and uh, through our network to surround them as best as we can and bring them to a place of healing. Uh, the perpetrator in, in many of our churches in talking about pedophilia, is that what we're talking about? Yes. yes. In, in a church of our size, we, we will <coughs> encourage them to go to another, another church where there's less chance of reoffense. And let me state this is, it's really hard for us to monitor, you know, the, the goings around of a pedophile as such in a congregation. But they're in a smaller church and we've given the brief to the, uh, the pastor where there's less, uh, where there's no children or something like that. We just feel that's a better um, way to go in caring for the, um, to be, the perpetrator. To be fair to you, sir, I think you have, in fact, a very detailed process called a, an ISAP. Yeah, I've realised that. Which, um, where you have somebody who's been identified as a yeah. pedophile, they then enter into a, a detailed process of support of that person, that is the pedophile, but also an agreement with the local church to assure that they are not a risk to children. Is that right? There, there is the policy there. Me personally, I probably would not engage it because of litigation. It's, um, but I definitely make sure that they could be positioned in a place where um, they could be cared for and helped. All right. And so you would not go through the ISAP plan process. Is that what you're saying? You ask me personally. Well, as as the what as, is as, as what do you recommend to, you, what do you recommend to is, your affiliate churches? Sorry, as a document, it is there. Yeah, and we would recommend that they use it. But I should have kept my personal thing out of it. All right. Is that a personal opinion that you express to affiliate churches? No. All right. Um, so just going back, and I think this is the last point I wanted to raise with you. Once... Uh, once the matter has been concluded by the police and, say, for example, they determine not to prosecute um, the alleged pedophile, mm -hmm. the alleged perpetrator, what is the process recommended by the ACC of New South Wales for any further investigation or substantiation of those allegations? OK. So a, a scenario, a child... So a, a family reports a situation to the police, it's investigated, and no criminal charges that's were correct. filed. That's correct. We're not talking about a child, we're talking about an adult who said, 10 years ago, when I was 15, for example, I was abused by a member of the church. We would do a, an internal investigation on that. And how would you do that? Through the processes of... Um, we wouldn't do it ourselves. We'd uh, uh, engage the services of an investigator who could look at that independently right. and bring back a report to us. All right. I don't seem to have seen a policy that sets, sets that out in the terms oh, that's a good point. with the clarity that you said. Right. Would you agree that it would be preferable to actually have a written policy that would state how what such an investigation mm. would occur? Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. All right. And that, that such a document would include manner in which the determination of whether the whether the allegation was proved or not proved yeah. was set out. Do you yeah. agree with that? Yeah. Providing support to the perpetrator? Support to the perpetrator and the accused victim or the victim, yeah. Yes. All right. Just wondering, uh, Commissioner, whether my learned friend is talking about a credential pastor in this scenario or talking about uh, a member of the church or a youth worker, I don't know. Yes. It's quite important. Yes, it is very important, and I thought I had clarified it earlier. Clearly, um, I hadn't to the degree that Mr Chaudhry asks. Uh, so I, I made a distinction earlier between pastors yeah, who were dealt with under the administration manual and the grievance procedure set out there. You understood that? Yeah. Yeah. And what I was just asking you about was <coughs> about members and volunteers and yeah, non-credentialed ministers. Do you understand that? Yeah. And all of what you said still applies yeah. to them, does it not? Yes, those are my questions. Sir. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Beckett. No, thank you. Mr. Higgins. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. McMartin, um, I just want to ask you some questions about the conversation you've had with uh, 
passed to Brian Houston about the allegation. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I understand you to say to Council Assisting that the note that you have been taken to of the meeting on the 28th of November 99 between yourself, Barbara and Brian Houston um, was the meeting at which you say you told Brian Houston of the allegation. That's not where I told him. I told him the week or two before that. Okay, so um, there were two meetings between you and Brian Houston. I talked to him on the phone um, Sorry, I about two weeks to... after I spoke to Wayne Alcorn and informed him of the allegation. Um, can I suggest this to you, that uh, when you spoke to Brian Houston on the phone about the allegation, um, it was apparent to you that it wasn't the first time he had heard of the allegation? I, I, can't, uh, I can't respond to that. Pastor, Pastor Brian could uh, respond to that in his statement is when I was speaking to him, it just seemed like a shock. And I'm not saying... No, I can't comment for him yet. Well, just as to that conclusion by you <coughs> that it appeared to shock Brian mm. Houston, what did he do or say <coughs> that enabled you to come to the conclusion that he was shocked? Oh, just his, just his voice changed and, um, <coughs> like, kind of, oh, no... You know, how do you know it's true? And I said, well, look, I don't. You've just got to investigate it. Um, when you, you say he said to you, how do you know it's true, um, were they the exact words that he used or do you mean that there were words consistent with that? It's, it doesn't say it's quote. It's words consistent with that. Right. Can, can I suggest to you that... Um, was his response to you along the lines of, uh, look, have we got some details about the complaint? <clears throat> Say that again. Was his words to you consistent with, have we got some details about the complaint? Right. That, that, that's what I would probably be thinking that he was thinking. All right. And... Because did you understand at that stage that he was waiting for his father to return from an overseas trip? Not really, no. You, you, I, you, it's 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. You knew that Frank Houston at that time was overseas for about a three-week period? I've heard that from here, yeah. All right. And does that sound inconsistent with your memory at that time? No. Right. It's fine. And... At the time that you say you had this telephone call with Brian Houston, um, was it apparent to you that he was asking you about whether or not you had detail because he was awaiting for his father to return to confront him about it? I take that... I'm just trying to find where the... Uh, you know, when I told Pastor Houston he's in shock, he said to me, do you know if it's true? And uh, I was probably thinking from that, have I got information? Have I got more information? Mm -hmm. And um, I did, didn't because I was still waiting for the statement. All right. Did you, did you understand from your telephone call with him that he was asking you, were you able to provide any detail uh, in preparation for his conference? No, not really. It wasn't that clear yet. Sorry, it wasn't that It wasn't clear. that clear that he was asking that. Um, you're not saying he wasn't asking, you're just saying it's not clear to yeah. you now. Is that right? Mm. Nodding your head, I take that's a yes. What's a yes? Uh, you're nodding your head. I'm taking that as a yes. I was unsure of what he was asking. No, that um, you're not saying he wasn't asking you that. It's just about your memory now. Right. Is that right? You, you can look into, you know, how do I know if it's true? I can't interpret what he meant by that. Was he asking, uh, have you got information? Which I hadn't. All I had was an accusation from... A, a lady. So that by the time that the meeting of the 28th of November came about, yeah. um, it was apparent to you that he had spoken to his father? 
I'm not sure. It's it seems like it was either before that or after it. Um, can I ask this? Excuse me. Can I ask that the note of Ms Taylor of the 28th be brought up? It should be an extra K. And by reference to item number one in that note, would you agree that accepting it as an accurate entry, it would suggest to you that by the time that meeting came about, such a meeting between Brian and his father, Frank, had occurred. Mm, seems that way, yeah. And not only had it occurred, but he had confronted him about the allegation mm. and that uh, he had confessed to some, some aspect of it. Yeah. And um, so by accepting that as an accurate recount of what was said to both of you at that meeting... It would suggest to you that by the 28th of November, uh, Brian Houston had confronted his father sure. about the allegation. Yep, fair enough. And that... Um, all right, just bear with me, please. move to another aspect, if I may. Sure. Um, although you were a state executive member, were you aware that as at 1999, the national executive of the Assemblies of God would meet every two months? Did I know that? No. You didn't know that? No. I knew they met. I thought they met three or four times a year, but I didn't know. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if the witness could be shown, please, uh, an extra G to Barbara Taylor's statement. Uh, this was not a letter to you. Uh, it should come up on the screen there. OK. Uh, this is a letter that uh, Barbara Taylor gave evidence that she sent to the complaint sure. at AHA. But I want you to have a look at the uh, second paragraph there and just read that. Yep. Uh, did you give that advice to Pastor Taylor? Yes, I did. And the requirement for a written accusation <laughs> with details at least as to the time and place of the allegations... Correct. Uh, ..was required by the policy. Correct? Correct. All right. Thank you. That could be taken down. Uh, if you could have a look at paragraph 59 of your statement, please. That could be brought up. You were taken to this paragraph by council assisting, and in particular the middle paragraph where the meeting between you, Mr Houston, Ms Taylor... We're trying to ascertain the facts of the matter, correct? Correct, yeah. And then you state after that sentence that this doubt arose from the fact that the victim, AHA, wished to remain anonymous. Yeah. All right. Uh, you were aware clearly at that time that the complainant did not wish to be known. You wanted to remain anonymous? Correct. All right. Uh, were you also aware that the... Uh, Victim AHA did not want a church investigation? Correct. You were aware at that time? You have to speak your answer. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I should ask about credentialing and credentials. At that time, that is in November, December 1999, were uh, ministers or pastors of the Assemblies of God given a actual card, a credential card? <laughs> I know we have one now. You can't recall if you had such a card in 1999? No. All right, thank you. 
I'll just take you to... We had a card, but I don't think it had the details of the photograph on it that it has now. Did you think there was a card of some sort back in 1999 that pastors had? I think there would have been, right. yeah. Was that card used, for example, for identification at hospitals where people wanted a pastor to administer to them? Yes, probably. I've been pastoring for 33 years and never taken it out of my wallet. All right, thank you. So. Thank you. Uh, please let me know if you don't know this. Mm. Uh, when a pastor's credentials are removed, is that card taken from them. It should be retracted. Right. It should you. be a physical handing over of the card. Yep. Thank you. Now, if the witness could be shown, this is in the policies bundle, and you were taken to this by council assisting. I've got my copy up. <coughs> so it's uh, tab 36, page 17. Thank you. We just start the energy. Uh, this is what we looked at before? Correct. Now, Mr McMartin, the policies of the church are quite lengthy, are they not? They're yep. very lengthy. Yep. And uh, you would have copies of these policies in your office? Yes. And you would be able to have recourse to them to refresh your memory of the policies? Sure. Correct? Thank you. If we can just go to the next uh, page. Thank you. Um, if we just go back up a little bit towards the top of the page. Hey, if we just go a little bit up to the top, I'm sorry. Right. Let me know if you need to see the previous page. Uh, but it uh, policy states that an attempt ought to be made to counsel them, this is a person the age of 16 and over, yep. the wisdom of reporting their situation to the police. That's the policy? Yep. Thank you. And the reason for that policy is then stated there in the paragraph, correct? Okay, yep. And yep. if we look at the next paragraph, uh, it's self-explanatory that while the consent of the uh, victim should be made, sometimes there are situations where other children at risk complaints should be made to the police, correct? Sure. yep. Thank you. Just pardon me for a moment. <coughs> oh, yes. Uh, at, that could be taken down. In uh, November 1999, oh, indeed, in November 1998, Mr Mudford, who we've heard of, he was not a credentialed minister of the Assemblies of God at that stage, was he? That's correct. And, in fact, did not become a credentialed minister. No, I don't think he ever has been. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. At the time in November 1999, uh, when you're talking with Barbara Taylor about the complaint of AHA... Yes. Were you aware that the allegation was that something of a sexual nature had occurred some 30 years ago? Correct. Thank you. Nothing further. Mr Beckett. Yes, yeah, just one matter arising out of that. Actually, there might be two. Um, you said a moment ago to an answer to a question from Mr Chowdhury that you understood... Um, I think in November of 1999 that, first of all, AHA wished to remain anonymous. Correct. And you were asked by Mr Chowdhury whether you were aware that AHA did not want a church investigation. Yes. And you answered yes to that. He did not want. That he did not want a church yeah. investigation. That was your answer mm. to it. Um, now, who... He, want, he wanted to keep his privacy... So, well, yeah. let's, let's just um, see if we can be specific about that. OK. Um, you've been told, and certainly the evidence in your statement, is that it had been communicated to you by Barbara Taylor that he wanted um, his identity kept confidential. Correct. Isn't that Correct. Right? Um, did you assume that because of that, together with 
the fact that you had no written complaint that he did not want to go through a church process? It got a bit confusing of who was pushing it and, um, and hearing um, the, the testimony is it seemed like Barbara and uh, Mr Mumford were pushing this gentleman out of his comfort zone. So it seemed like there was a greater commitment from uh, Mr Mumford to uh, proceed with this than the victims. Who told you, if anybody, that he that AHA did not want to have a church investigation? Barbara. Sorry? Barbara? Mrs Taylor? Did she, say, did, did she say that, or what words did she say to you about that? He just didn't want his name to be public. <coughs> and so that? you then concluded from that that he did not want um, a church investigation to occur. Is that right? Yeah, I was giving him the, um, the choice to put in a complaint. If he put in the complaint, then that would mean, yeah, go ahead, have, have, your, um, have your investigation. <coughs> um, I want to take you back to, to that issue about did not want a church investigation. I'll ask the question again. You concluded from what Barbara Taylor had told you about keeping his name anonymous that he did not want a church investigation to occur. True. Even if you go... Sorry, did you say true? Yes, then. True. Yeah. If, can we look at a, a pamphlet here? A s Sorry, what, which, I'm what? just looking at uh, Barbara's statements. You and have I a document in front of you, do you? Sorry, I wasn't yeah. aware of that. What so, document do you have in front of uh, you? Barbara's statement. Okay, well, like Barbara Taylor's statement. If it can just... Um, I'll have it brought up on the screen so that we can all look at the same okay, document. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to find it. <coughs> 20, 25th of November. Is there a particular paragraph number, or are you referring to an extra A? Oh, just just the, the the concept where just so just so we have the same paragraph that you're looking at, all for us. Twenty uh, fifth of November. Uh, what else am I looking at? Can I just give you a quick look at it? So I'm not sure what document that is. Um, why don't uh, the doc? Sorry. Um, I wonder if you could hand it to the court officer and I'll just have a look at uh, what you're referring to. This one here with the asterisk, please. <clears throat> Is that, which one's this? 25th of November. Oh. Yes, if an extra J to Barbara Taylor's statement could be brought up. And I'll just hand the document back to you. Sir, do you have any other documents there? Just my um, testimony, yeah, statement. All right. Yes, yeah, so... So in, in response, this is on the 25th of November 1999. Yes. He said the church would only say a little prayer and sorry. He said there's no benefit to go to the church. The church wouldn't do anything about it anyhow. All right. So, so um, it's, qu it's quite important for, for, these sorts of, for this sort of evidence that um, you state what you understood at the time in November 1999 from your memory. My memory and is... Not, and, and, a... and not what I think you're doing, and I'll ask you a question about that. <laughs> What you're saying now is based on having read Barbara Taylor's document at 25th yeah. of November 1999. Is that Probably. correct? Probably. I'll put it away. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask you um, was, and I'll, you know, I notice the time, I just have yes. one, one very small point to, to make. Um, you recall you had a conversation 
with um, Pastor Alcorn yes. um, about what to do with the allegation made against Frank Houston. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And he suggested that the matter be taken to Brian Houston? Correct. As a member of the National Executive? Yes. And at that point, did you raise any issue about a conflict of interest that Brian Houston might have between being his father's son and at the same time being the national president yeah, of sure. the Assemblies of God? I was, I was confident it would get dealt with appropriately because not only did Pastor Brian know about it, but also Pastor Alcorn knew about it. And uh, I knew that them as a team would, uh, would deal with it appropriately. So you put your trust in both of those gentlemen yes. to uh, act appropriately and uh, independently? Yes. All right. Yep. Um, did you raise any potential conflict of interest with Pastor Alcorn? Why would I do that? Well, because the matter was having, that is, the allegations against Frank Houston were being uh, dealt with by his son. Oh, OK, I got you. No, I didn't. Um, later, when you met with Brian Houston in the meeting that we think we've established as being at the 28th of November 1999, sure. did you have any discussion there about uh, a conflict of interest no. between those two roles? No. no. Yes, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Baker. Just a couple of matters before I excuse you, um, Pastor McMartin. The first one just touches upon this issue about the formal written complaint procedure that you've given evidence about. Yes. <clears throat> and firstly, just to ask you about what you understood the procedure to be uh, as at the time that this complaint 19, was brought to your attention. Yeah. In 1999. Yeah. My understanding of the procedure back then is that, that I hear a complaint and then we ask the person, do you want to take it forward? And uh, then we require a written complaint that states the name of the perpetrator, the place, the time, and some detail. And from that, we can use that as a, uh, to confront, if you want to say, the, um, the perpetrator, and just gives us a, 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 a um, evidence. So that was um, the procedure in place for yes. the Assemblies of God in 1999. Correct. Did that procedure distinguish between child complainants and, and adult complainants? It, it probably... Um, it was similar but different. If a, if a child uh, had a complaint, they'd talk to someone that was caring and that kind of stuff. If the parent got involved, they would write the complaint. Did you actually have any experience of dealing with uh, such issues as at 1999? With pedophilia? With um, either children making complaints about um, allegations of child sexual abuse within the church? No, I can't say that. Uh, or, or adults making complaints of what had occurred to them as children no. within the church? So, it, as at 1999, this was the first time you had confronted such a situation? Correct. Um, with respect now to the policies in, in place for um, those churches affiliated with the um, Australian Christian churches, is it your understanding that a requirement for a formal written complaint is what's required now to initiate action? I think we have moved forward from that. I'd say it should be still part of the procedure, but there may be other ways of creating that. Mm. You know, through conversation with the, the victim, scribing that down. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I, I think I do, but I'll just clarify that with you, that... Your answer is that the current procedure in place for those churches um, complying with the policy or procedures of the um, Australian Christian churches is that a formal written statement from the complainant 
is um, not required to initiate a complaint. It, it it's needs no, <clears throat> no longer required. I think it can still be required, but I think there needs to be um, created other ways where there can be a, a, a complaint can be substantiated. Well, quite clearly, one would assume that, that you don't require a 10-year-old making a no. complaint to make a formal That's written correct. complaint. Yeah. Yeah. And indeed, somebody who might be reporting something that's happened, uh, that they allege has happened 10 or 15 years ago, yeah. might struggle with time and place. Sure, sure. So I, th I, think, I think the procedure has got wider of ways that people can funnel in their complaint. Well, when you through, say you through conversation, through written, <coughs> and th th then they are investigated. When you say you think, um, is that something that can be found now in the documents? I'm just that not have been too produced? sure right at the moment what that procedure is. I'm sorry. Are you able to assist with that, Mr. Chowdhury? Uh, it's in the uh, grievance procedure, which is Exhibit uh, KA15. And under step one, receipt of complaint. We are able to find that. Are you familiar with this document, Pastor McMartin? Well, when I need it, I, I get it out. I've read it through a few times. And um, so if the situation comes up, I get familiar with it. Yeah. And in particular, Mr Chowdhury? Yes, it's under step one, receipt of complaint, uh, is the current policy. should indicate to the Commission that in respect of suspected child abuse of a child, mm. it is different. There's a different policy and it does not require a written complaint. Mm. If there's a report to anyone within the church, then if it's a child, manda the mandatory proceedings take place. So, and that's um, that's contained in the document that's been previously Correct. Um, on the screen that um, is so the Child Protection it. Policies that's and it. Procedures 2005. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's uh, tab 36 of the yes. uh, policies and procedures. Yes. And I should say in the grievance policy, which is the document we're talking about now, there is a step two is mandatory reporting. Yes. Uh, but the two policies probably need to be read in conjunction with each other. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Just one other matter, Pastor McMartin, which relates to um, the removal of credentials. Sure. Have you ever personally been involved in removing the credentials of a, a credentialed yes, I have. pastor of the church? Yes, yeah. And how, how recently were you involved in such an action? I became president of our denomination in October 2008 and uh, November 2009 I had to deal with that situation. Right. And did you give a formal notice with respect to the suspension of credentials? Yes, I phoned him and told him of the, um, we're suspending him so we can investigate a situation. I sent him an email and a, confirming that that had happened and we received his uh, certificate back. 
And where does that notice of sus that, I mean, the email is that's the written document, is it? Yeah. And where does that then go? We keep a copy for ourselves, and, and who, a copy goes who's to him. we? The state, the state executive. Sorry, yeah, in our files. And then we investigate. If the investigation takes longer than thirty days, we extend the suspension. And I can only suspend a credential with the permission of our national president. So I, I've got to explain to him the situation and uh, then he'll say yes or no, it needs to be suspended so you can investigate. Anything arising out of that? Uh, yes, one, one small matter arising about that. Um, um, in tab 38 of the policies and procedures document, we have a, um, a report form for disclosure. I'll have it brought up, it's Ringtail triple zero one zero zero one zero two nine eight thank you so this is uh, part of a document called the implementation pack for towards safe places an awareness program for creating safe places in our churches that's a that's you're correct, aware yeah. of that document yep. And that includes a number of forms which assist with reporting. Yes. Um, and the purpose, as I understand it, of this policy is really with respect to current children. Yes. Who, uh, where there are concerns of, about child sexual abuse. Yeah. Maybe reported by the child or by somebody else. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yeah. I think it takes in uh, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, and... If we go to the report, it says this form is to be completed by the head of department in conjunction with the senior pastor using yes. one or more child protection incident report forms. Do you see that? Yes. Um, that's so. It's not a form that applies to adults. No, this at is least on child. this post. Yep. Yes. Um, but the process that seems clear from your statement, from your statement and from the policy, is that once the issue, that is, the disclosure is made by a child, say, to a, mm. a, a child worker, um, she or he then provides it to the head of the department yes. to start that process rolling. Yep. And this process here doesn't require um, the child or even a representative of the child to complete it. It seems to be that it's something that's done by the head of the department on the basis of the information he or she has received. Is that That's right? Correct. Yes. Now, you were taken by Mr Chowdhury to the grievance procedure which applies to pastors. Yes. Is there some benefit, do you think, in having a similar form and a similar approach apply to that grievance procedure? I think so. I think anything that would help us do our job better, yeah. I think it's a good addition. And do you see the way in which this appears to work is there's not a requirement for consent mm. from the discloser. Yep. Once the information comes to light, the process commences and then you're taken through the process yep. without there being this block that we seem to have had in AHA's case. Yep. Do, you, do you appreciate that? I can appreciate that. And with that in mind there is some benefit in adopting this process over the one that's currently in the grievance procedure? Whatever the policy ends up being, you know, we would follow that. What I've done over the years is I've stuck by the policy. We need it to be written. If that needs to be changed, you know, the, the policy's got to be changed. Yes, but do you appreciate what I'm saying? I appreciate there, what you're saying. There seem to be easier. two different policies. Yeah. One for pastors yeah. and one for general child protection matters. Yeah. Yeah. And do you see that there's benefit in adopting the process under the Child Protection Manual whereby you don't require the consent of the complainant to start the process? Yeah. Do you agree with that? I, I, I hear you, um, and it probably, it probably has traction. The only problem I have is any, anyone could accuse any minister of anything and process begin. If there's a, if there's a written document states to me that they are serious about pursuing this. I'm not saying your idea is wrong, it just needs to be thought about. All right, thank you. Thank you. Nothing arising out of that for you, Mr Chowdhury. Right. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. You're excused, uh, Pastor McMartin. Thank, thank you very much. Attendance, and we'll resume it too. All stand. <laughs>
how it's all spent. Your Honour, I understand Mr. Pratt is here for Mr. Smith and wishes to announce his appearance. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. My Senate is Pratt. You should see Solicitor with Gil Shannon and Luton in Brisbane. I seek leave to appear on behalf of the Reverend Dr. Dennis Smith and also Christian Senate. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. I understand that application has formally been um, placed before the Commission and leave granted. Okay. Your Honour, I call George Agajanian. Thank you, Mr Agajanian. Do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? The oath. Can you raise the Bible in your right hand, please, and repeat after me? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. If you just replace the Bible, please, and take a seat just roughly. Thank you. Mr. Agajanian, I wonder if you could state your full name to the royal commission. George, George Gregory Agajanian. Thank you. And uh, you've provided uh, your address to the Royal Commission, haven't you? Yes, I have. And uh, you've also provided a statement uh, to the Royal Commission dated the 29th of September 2014. Is that That's correct? correct. Um, do you have any changes to make to that statement? No. Um, is the statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? It is. I tender the statement. 18.0012. Mr Agajanian, you're currently the, um, the general manager of Hillsong Church Limited, is that right? That's correct. And um, before that, you were the business manager of Hills Christian Life Centre. Yes. Um, and uh, after that, did you become the business manager of uh, Hillsong Church? It, yes, it's a bit of transition. Yes. That's correct. All right. And um, when did you become the general manager? That's a good question. I'm not quite sure. In that transition period sometime. In the transition period? Absolutely. In, but in any event, you've been the general manager for a number of years now. Oh, absolutely, yes. And um, one of your positions as uh, as business, business manager, sorry, I'll withdraw that. One of your responsibilities as general manager is to oversee uh, the policies and procedures of um, Hillsong Church, is that right? It's correct. And that includes child policy procedures yes. and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and you're familiar with them as well? Yes, I am. Yes. All right. I'll take you to, uh, I'll take you to a document. <coughs> it's um, tab 11 of the policies and procedures <coughs> document. Can come up, please? of the policies and procedures, not the tender bundle for Hillsong. Thank you. So you'll see this is a, a document entitled Hillsong Church Protecting and Supporting Children and Young People. Yes. Um, am I right in saying that this is the major policy that Hillsong Church has with respect to those matters? That's correct. It's our latest version. And um, when you say latest, it's the current version? The current version, yes. yes. And if we just go to the contents page, which is the next page from the title page, we'll see that a number of matters are included there, including uh, the code of conduct, which requires um, people to act in certain ways and not to act in other ways. Yes. And for the purpose of the Royal Commission, includes a prohibition on sexual abuse of children. Yes. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, and then... Child Protection and Law sets out the, the obligations. I think this was in uh, at least in New South Wales and some other states as well. Correct. As to mandatory reporting. Correct. In those matters. Yes. Um, and some assistance is provided to the reader in, uh, in 
identifying harm to children. Is that right? Yes. And then there are two steps, dealing with complaints and reporting requirements and disclosure of abuse. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And both of those chapters um, deal with the matters that, that are set out there, namely the way in which Hillsong Church will handle complaints um, from reception through to the various steps that are disclosed in there. Is that right? Yes. All right. I'll just take you to uh, <coughs> Chapter 7, which is at Ringtail 23. That'll come up in a moment. Um, now, the issue of mandatory reporting is dealt with throughout this document, so there's some crossover there, but let's um, just go to the main elements of this part of the policy. Um, you'll see that, um, that the person who is disclosing is to be listened to and to be taken seriously. Do you see that? Which section are you quoting from? On the yes. left-hand side. Listen to the person taken seriously. Yes, yes under 7.1. <clears throat> yes. So um, I, should, I should have asked you some questions generally about the application of this policy. Um, applies to all staff and volunteers at Hillsong Church, is that right? Correct. And does it also apply to pastors? Yes, they're, they're staff. All right. And um, are, are all the pastors referred to or considered to be staff? Yes, our pastors are our staff. Uh, if we do have any lay pastors, they would come under the volunteer heading. All right. What about uh, Brian and, and uh, Bobby Houston? Are they considered to be staff? Absolutely. Yep. All right. So c coming back to the policy that's on the screen there, um, then the person who receives the disclosure of um, child sexual abuse um, is not only to be listened to and taken seriously, but the person who receives it is asked not to probe or investigate further. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the reasons is that that might um, interfere with later criminal or civil proceedings. Yes. Um, then the person disclosing is to be supported, made safe and made to feel safe and comfortable. Yes. And that um, there are other needs says pastoral welfare and legal needs of the person are to be addressed. What, what, what is that process? What is offered to, to people who come forward in this way to disclose child sexual abuse? Are you referring to the victims? Or I am, to the victims, yes. The victims, yes. Um, usually the a victim would approach one of our uh, pastoral team. Um, it's the duty of the pastoral team to establish the facts. Uh, if they need, uh, if they find that the uh, the victim uh, needs counselling or needs any any specific uh, personal attention or help, we would offer that to them. Uh, if they need legal advice, we have uh, a network of lawyers that we work with that we would we could refer them to, including legal aid. Uh, it's really establishing what their needs are as a church and trying to to help them. Uh, um, with the situation they're facing at that point. All right. And then you go to the second column, so I need to scroll back to the top of that page, under privacy and communication. You go through a process of telling the, the child who is disclosed or <coughs> relevant person that you have an obligation to make a report to your local government agency if a child under 16 is at risk of harm. Correct. All right. So in New South Wales, for example, that means that you would tell the person that you, there's an obligation under re mandatory reporting guidelines to report the matter to the Department of Family and Community Services. Correct. And then you would also tell uh, a position known as a pastoral care oversight. What does that mean? Uh, that would be the, the, uh, the pastor overseeing the situation. Uh, in, in each campus, we have a, uh, a head pastor or a, uh, a pastor that looks after our other pastors. It's kind of like a department head. So it, that's, uh, that means that they need to, to, to push that information up the line. 
All right. Um, then there's some other matters dealt with in that paragraph. You'll see it says, under no circumstances, try to contact the alleged perpetrator. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and so that's for the person who receives the first disclosure from the child. Correct. All right. Um, leave, and then it says, do not contact a non-offending parent or a supportive family member. Leave this to community services. Is that yes. right? Yes. Um, and then do not disclose to any person the name of the, the child or young person or the alleged perpetrator. Is that right? Correct, yes. Um, but that material is to be given to uh, the parcel care department head. Yes. Is that right? Yes, who's required to keep the information confidential. All right. And then it says the pastoral care department head will notify within 24 hours the general manager or lead pastor to discuss that a report has to be made. Do you see that? Uh, it needs to scroll down a little bit, but yes, yes. that is oh, in I'm our sorry policy. About that. Yes, that yes. is in our policy, correct. Uh, so a report has to be made. That's a reference to reporting under the mandatory reporting requirements. Is that That's right? That's an internal report to, to, uh, to me. And um, so where were you reading from, I'm sorry? Sorry, the last dot point there under internal reporting. The pastoral care department head? Yes. Uh, that's notification to me as general manager. Yes. All right. To just, but then it says <clears throat> to discuss that a report has to be made. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. That's what it does refer to. That's a reference to? To facts, re correct. Reporting to facts. Oh. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Now... <coughs> Without going to it, there's a uh, next section of the policy is recruitment of staff and volunteers, and then there is a, a further policy with respect to um, those who have been found to be sex offenders. What I wanted to ask you is going to that, that point at 7.2, internal reporting. Once the matter has made its, its way to the pastoral care department head, yes. and indeed to you, mm -hmm. what happens? Once we gather the evidence, or the facts, I should say, the information... Okay, well, I'll, let me stop you there. Who is tasked with gathering the facts? Right. And what steps do they take? The pastoral care uh, uh, team, or the pastoral care department head. So whether it's one of our pastors, there, there would be a pastor dealing with the situation. That, info, that person dealing with the victim would be charged with uh, pulling the facts together. Uh, they would fill in a notification form, which is in the policy. That form would go to the uh, oversight of the pastoral care department, and then ultimately that form would come to me. Yes. And, and once we have that information, um, I usually will get some legal advice. I will call our lawyers, I'll say, I'm dealing with this situation, especially if it's not clear cut. Um, and, and based on the information I get, uh, we will put a report into facts and, uh, and most probably go to the police as well. Um, there doesn't seem to be any guidelines expressly in this policy for your part of the equation. That is to say, once you've received the report of the disclosure, mm -hmm. what steps are be ta to be taken next? Can you assist us with indicating whether there's a policy document that covers those matters? No, this is it, basically. All right. Now, um, during the process of, um, of obtaining documents from Hillsong, we were given uh, a copy of the 2005 ACC New South Wales Child Protection Policy. Yes. You're aware of that document? I'm aware of it, yes. All right. Is that one that has been adopted by Hillsong to deal with these sorts of matters? No, it's, it's a document that we have uh, gleaned information from. Uh, we have formulated our policies ourselves, and what we uh, do is we go to several sources, including the ACC, uh, community services, and various whatever other government uh, authorities and sites that we can find that deal in this information. And, and through our research, we put our own documentation together. We have a psychologist who works with us, and we also have, uh, we run it by uh, our legal people. All right. Um, now... It's, I'll take you to your statement now. If Paragraph 15, if your statement could come up, please. Um, you recall this part of your statement? Yes, I do. Now, 
It's the latter half of the statement I want to take you to, but the, the first part of it actually covers um, the existing policies and procedures have been de developed over time. Mm -hmm. um, staff and volunteers are required to make a report to their immediate oversight. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and um, that coincides with those parts of the policy I've just taken to you, yes. taken you to. That's right, isn't it? Correct. And um, I should say, even though the policy clearly applies to people who are children at the moment, does it also apply to adults who are disclosing child sexual abuse? Absolutely. Right. Um, then, if we go back to paragraph 15, this oversight or department head will escalate the matter to either the senior pastor or to me as the general manager? Yes, correct. Then a decision is made about... Um, sending the matter to fax mm -hmm. or to the police yes and what's the what guideline if any do you determine whether a matter should be sent to the police or not the i suppose i would come back to the the, the, the serious the, the level of seriousness of the allegation um, once i get legal advice uh, I could be guided then to whether the matter needs to go to the police or not. I, I rely really heavily on our lawyers to give me that kind of direction. All right. Well, let's go to the next part. All substantiated allegations and individuals with known convictions results in the person being asked not to attend Hillsong Church or related activities. That's, that's a blanket rule that applies. Correct. It? Yes, all right. Then, then you say, if the allegations are historical or not confirmed yes. sufficiently to ask the person to leave Hillsong, yes. the person against whom they are made may become a person of interest. Yes. All right, so let's, uh, I'm going to try and unpack what that means. What do you mean by historical? We have situations where, um, for example, somebody may transfer from another church. We don't know who that individual is the background of that individual is, but we might get a tip-off, say, for example, from their minister, and we've had this happen, where they where they have said to us, um, you know, uh, we can't prove anything, however, uh, we have suspicions about this individual, their, their behavior, uh, relating to their behavior uh, with with minors and so on, and, and if there is no finding or conviction against this individual, we, our pastoral team, We'll uh, place them under observation. All right. Now, you have a screening process, I think, that, uh, that applies to the introduction of new people such as that, do you not? No, I'm not sure what you're referring uh, to. In terms of working with children checks? Oh, absolutely, and, yes. 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 Right. So they would need to go through that process, wouldn't they? Yes, yes. We're, we're talking here in the context, context of them just attending our church. Oh, I see. This is nothing to do with working with children. Uh, we're... We approach the uh, protection of our children and youth holistically in the sense that it's not just about individuals working with children, it's individuals who may have access to children by the mere nature that they attend our church. And that's what this refers to. So these are people that we place under observation to make sure they don't try and get into areas where children are being looked after, uh, Sunday school type classes. Um, uh, the situation here is broader than children as well. There are instances where we have had um, information to say that maybe a certain male individual uh, is exhibiting behavior that's inappropriate towards females, adult females. That person would be placed under observation as well. So it's any, any kind of characteristic or behavior that would endanger, or potentially endanger, uh, members of our church. All right. Can I just ask you then... Um, did you receive yesterday evening a copy of a letter from Mr. Tony Juni dated uh, 9th of October 2014? I did, Morrison, yes. With a number of questions? Yes, I did. And um, together with Mr. Gerber, who I understand is assisting, uh, assisting Hillsong Church today, um, you prepared a number of answers to those questions? Yes, I did. Yes. Um, and are the, the, the answers to those questions true, true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, they are. Yes, I'll tender both of those documents. Yes. Copies. 
So I'll just run briefly through those some of those matters there and to pick up the policy questions as, as we do. First of all, um, you were asked as to whether, um, whether Hillsong had reported um, any completed disciplinary proceedings with respect to Frank Houston to the Commission for Children and Young People um, after he was disciplined. And I think the answer to that was that you had not recall any reports being made to any of the government authorities. All right. Um, and I think you say in, in the answer that the matter was overlooked due to a lack of understanding at the time of the, uh, the child protection regime. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Now... The laws had just come out at the time. Uh, there was a... We were trying to get our heads around who to report to, docs, and we were under the assumption that uh, a report to docs was sufficient. So obviously, that was not the case. All right. So what I wanted to come to was uh, the answers to question six. Now, question six was, uh, which policy or procedure is used for the investigation and resolution of an allegation of child sexual abuse where the matter is not referred to the police and, or you should say, or, or after the police have completed an investigation? And... You say uh, in your answer to question six that the current policy and procedure describes how all complaints and allegations of abuse should be recorded and provided to pastoral care and are required to be referred to the general manager. For all matters relating to staff, you have a discipline and termination policy and uh, that has been tendered as part of these proceedings. Uh, now, my question to you is not so much as how those matters come to you or indeed to the pastoral care head, but what happens after that they have come to you? And Are so you referring to uh, matters relating to staff or matters relating to general allegations about...? Well, we'll, we'll do with each of those. So um, after the matter... If the matter relates to a member of staff and it has not been referred to the police, how is it dealt with within Hillsong Church? The, the matter is dealt under our, our employment agreement with, and policies with, uh, with regard to staff. Um, if we receive an allegation against a staff member, that staff member is immediately suspended. The, um, uh, we would then go about uh, collating, collating the facts of the matter, uh, getting input from uh, the, the individuals making the allegation, as well as the information from the staff member. Once we, we put together the, our findings, we would give the staff member the opportunity to meet with us. They can bring a, a co-worker to, to, uh, to that meeting. We would present our findings to the staff member um, and also the actions we uh, prepare to take based on our findings. Uh, and those actions can vary from uh, a, a putting them on probation right through terminating them. All right. And um, if we then turn to the way in which um, a member is dealt with, what's the process there? You have an allegation of child sexual abuse. It's made its way to you as the general manager. Um, it hasn't been referred to the police or perhaps the police have finished their investigation and decided not to prosecute. Yes. What do you do? What is the process within Hillsong Church for handling such allegations? If the allegation is proven, um, or it's just an allegation at this point? It's just an allegation and the police have decided not to prosecute. Well, I suppose we would have to establish if that member was a volunteer or one of our workers, because uh, uh, under the current legislation, we would have to re report that to Children's Guardian. Um, and, and if I have any doubts, I would give our lawyers a call and just check with them as to what the best way forward is in, in that particular situation. Whenever we deal with issues that relate to children, we are overly cautious, and I would rather take advice rather than just act on my own uh, uh, solution. Um. 
you said you um, your approach appears to be that when you get to that stage that you seek um, you seek advice from your legal advisors. Um, do you think there is some benefit likely to arise if uh, Hillsong was to de develop um, um, a, a complete policy, a full policy, if you like, to deal with those matters? Absolutely. We're, we're constantly looking at how we can update and upgrade uh, the policies we have in place and uh, where we identify areas of weakness. We're uh, absolutely committed to updating that and uh, rectifying that. All right. Um, you probably heard some evidence earlier today about the, the position under the ACC policy of a written complaint yes. of, um, of abuse. What, what is the approach of uh, Hillsong Church to that particular requirement? Our requirement is the, uh, the complaint can come in any form, verbal, written. Um, it is only after we receive the complaint our people are required to put it in writing through the notification form and, and then shoot it up line. But we will receive allegations in any form. We're not, we're not um, it doesn't have to be in a written form to us. All right, now. And, and sorry, and often it's not. Often it will come out in a, in a pastoral meeting or it might come out in a, in a camp situation where, you know, where we might be praying for a group of children and one of those children just decides to, uh, to share information with us. And then that's when the matter is, is dealt with according to our policy and is escalated to me. Yes. Um, finally, I think I'd be quick here. You were asked, uh, what is the policy and procedure with respect to the handling of allegations against a senior member of Hillsong Church yes. that raises a conflict of interest? Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And uh, while you've given an answer there at, uh, for paragraph 7, I note that um, you've recently identified, through a gap analysis, um, an absence of a formalised policy for conflict of interest. Is that right? That's correct. So it's reasonable to say that, um, as of today, there's no formal policy that governs conflict of interest matters. Is that right? It is dealt with in our employment agreement, yes. but as it relates to this matter, no. All right, and um, so that's something that I think you've indicated to the Royal Commission is going to be developed? Absolutely. All right. And um, usefully, usefully for us, you seem to have set out a number of other gaps um, in the policy that are currently under active consideration, and that's included in your answer to question eight. Is correct. that right? Yes. That is correct. <coughs> yes, those are my questions. Thanks, Mr Pickett. Mr. Vinci. Um, Mr. Chowdhury. No questions, thank you. No, no. questions. Mr. No, Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Ogajanian. Thank, thank you for your attendance. You're otherwise you. excused. Your Honour, Commissioner Atkinson, that concludes the. Um, for the moment, the, the sorry, I withdraw that. That concludes the evidence with respect to Hillsong Church and the allegations against uh, Frank Houston. Um, the next witness um, concerns Northside Christian Centre, incorporated under its various names, um, and um, the first witness that we have had been allocated a pseudonym and Your Honour had made an order for that to occur. Um, I'm now instructed that she wishes to have her name and identity made public and um, a revocation order has been, um, had, in draft form, has been provided to me. Perhaps uh, Ms McGlinchey, who represents her, could confirm just confirm that, Ms. Um, uh, um, just announce my appearance for Emma Joy Fretton, uh, Your Honour. Uh, yes, my instructions are that um, Ms. Fretton would uh, like to give her evidence under her own name without the pseudonym. Thank you, Ms. McBenchie. So I'll, I will make. Um, Your Honour, I'll hand up the draft order. Thank you. That hopefully, will assist you.
Yes, I've made uh, that direction in the terms in which it's been drafted. But I'm unfamiliar with the protocol. Uh, is it just permissible that we leave? Or um, ask to be excused? Yes, I will excuse you, Mr Higgins. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and those instructing you. Your Honour, that uh, direction having been made, I call Emma Joy Fretton. Ms Fretton, just before you take a seat. Sorry. That's all right. Um, do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? Oath so, on the Bible, please. All right. So if you just raise the Bible in your right hand, please, and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but and the nothing truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. So if you just replace the Bible. Thank you. And just take a seat there right where you are. Thank you. Ms Fretton, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission, please. My full name is Emma Joy Fretton, formerly known as Emma Joy Hayes. And um, uh, you provided your address to the Royal Commission, I understand? Um, yes, I have. Thank you. And you've also provided the Royal Commission with a statement dated the 8th of October 2014. Correct. Uh, are there any parts of that statement you would like to change? Not of this previous, no. Um, is the statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? It's 100% correct. Thank you. I tender the statement. 18.0014. Now, Ms Fretton, um, I'm going to ask you to read out your statement, but before yes. I do, I just wanted to indicate that... Um, I appreciate that there are a number of very sensitive matters contained in your statement. Yes. If there's, um, if you need to take a break while you're doing so, then, then um, well, I'm sure that Her Honour yes. will will um, accommodate that. Thank you. Um, if you wish me to read it or your counsel to read it instead, or any part of your statement, then just please say so, and, okay. and we can do Thank that. You. Yes. All right. Um, please uh, start from from the beginning. Okay. Are you. Yes, you've already, you've, you've already had that indicated to you that it'll come up on the screen there yes. in front of you. And then just read it. And, and um, I'm also assuming, I can't exactly see, but I'm assuming you've got a glass of water down there in front of you as well. Yes, that's okay. fine. Thank you. This, part, this statement was made accordingly, sets out the incident evidence that I am prepared to give to the Royal Commission into the institutional response into child sex abuse. This statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and my belief. Where I discard speech is referred into this statement is provided in words or words to the effect in those which were used to the best of my regulation. My full name is Emma Joy Fretton, formerly known as Emma Hayes. My date of birth is 1980. I have previously been known as Emma Hayes. I commenced at Northside Christian College at McLean's Road, Bundura, Victoria in 1986. I was, in, I was six years old and in grade one with Kenneth Sanderlance was my teacher. He was also my teacher in grade two and grade three. Northside Christian College is a religious school and is assemblies Assemblies of God Church connected to the school. Mr Sanderlands used to have portable typewriter in his classroom. I remember that it would... I remember that, that it was black and that every time he finished typing, that thing would go ding and then it would have to be pushed up to the, to the side. It's like when the paper rolls up. I'm not sure which grade I was in when Mr Sandlance would take the typewriter from his desk outside and call me out. It would be on the wooden bench. The rest of the class were left inside the girl, the two girls. Excuse me. The rest of the class were left inside and the two girls would read them stories. The girls were in the class as me. 
Mr. Sam Lance would make up sexual stories about my family and then <coughs> and then type them out. He would make me repeat the stories and agree where they were true. After each story, he would make me sign it. He wrote he wrote the stories like I was telling the story. I remember that he made me sign one piece of paper that he told me was a contract saying that I would not tell anyone and what was happening. He told me that if I ever told anyone that they would not believe me and he would show them all the stories and tell them that I had come to him come to him about them. He kept all these stories in a file. I do not remember how many stories he typed, but the file was very, very thick. Very. If, it, if I ever tried to deny that the things in the stories happened, he would hit me with a wooden paddle on my backside. He would use the paddle, he would take me into the sports room, which was in the, black, uh, was in the back of the classroom. There was a sports gear in the... There was sports gear kept in the room and the wall was just joined to the classroom, had glass on the top of it, three quarters of the window, was covered up by posters and behind the posters so one could, so no one could see what was happening. Once I wore my knickers and bloomers over the top of the, over the top of, once I wore my knickers and bloomers over the top to school so I didn't hurt as much when he hit me. Mr. Sandlands hit me once, then pulled up my dress and pulled down my knickers and my bloomers together. I asked him what he was doing. He didn't answer me or speak to me. He just, he then just started to touch me inappropriately. I was crying and asking him to stop. He kept going and it was rough and it made me feel sick in my stomach. Then he turned and, and then, he then turned, stopped and started hitting me on my backside with the paddle. He did not pull my knickers or bloomers up all my dress down. Mrs. Sandlance counts when he hits me and I remember he counted up to 12. I was crying and my backside was really sore. Mrs. Sandlance made me sit on the seat and left me there. He left me sitting there for a while and then came back in and told me I couldn't come back into the classroom unless I stopped crying. There, there were other times when he touched me inappropriately, but the, that time sticked with me in mind because he hit me so many times. Because he would just hit me, sometimes he would just hit me, but other times he would touch me, then hit me. After this time, every, after this time, every time Mr. Sandlands told me stories, he would agree with them and tell them that they were true and had happened, so I would not get hit. <laughs> After I started agreeing with Mr. Sandlance, he would start saying that I had li lifted my dress up in the front of the boys or on the bus. I would, I would get hit. I would get hit for that. It felt like Mr. Sandlance would use any excuse or say or say I was in trouble, so he could hit me. He would he would single me out of for some reason. Mrs. Sandlands would never let any of the girls in my class go to the toilet during class time. The boys were allowed to leave the classroom and go to the toilet any time they wanted. I can remember one one member of a number of occasions myself and other girls in the class wet themselves. We if we asked to go to the toilet, he would tell us to wait and then tell us to stand beside our chair and do it there. I can remember he told one girl she had to stand up in front of the class and wet herself, and that was in front of the whole class. After we went, after we wet our knickers, Mr. Sandlance would make us take our knickers off and he would tell us that he would go and wash them out. He would then leave the room with the knickers and go and be gone for a while. He would, he would get back. When he got back, he would hang the knickers on a clothesline, which was outside the window. I can remember there sometimes was being 10 to 11 pants of knickers hanging outside the clothesline where, where, where we, we were never given any other knickers to put on or knickers back when they were dry. When we used to line up in the classroom, the boys used to go in first and the girls... When the boys used to go in first and the... And when it was the girl's turn to go in, Mr. Sandlance would touch us on the head and tell us that he loved us. When he would let us go in until he told, until we told him that we loved him. 
If I didn't tell him I, I didn't love him, he would then hit me with a paddle later on. He would then, he would do this only to the girls and not the boys. No, can, I just, it, can I just stop you there? If, if you wouldn't mind, could you just slow down a little bit? I'm as guilty as anybody about uh, speaking quickly, particularly in, in uh, the Royal Commission, but if you could just slow down a little bit, that I think would help. Okay, I'll try. I don't like reading my statement, so when I read it, I like to read fast because I don't like to recall anything. So that's how I oh, yeah, try you. and deal with it yes. myself. Please but I'll try and slow down as best as I can. I'm not a very good reader either, so I'm doing the best as I can for my Indeed. knowledge. When Mr Sandland used to read our stories from the books, he used to sit on a wooden stool. The girls had to sit on the floor in front of him. The boys had to sit on the floor behind the girls. Mrs Sandlands would tell two of the girls to sit either side of his legs and tell them to rub his legs underneath his pants. We, we had to rub between the knees and the ankles. If we stopped, he would tell us to, ru to keep rubbing. It felt disgusting as he had <laughs> very hairy legs. It would then tell one of the girls to sit on his lap. It would not be directly on his, directly on his lap. It would be... He would spread his legs and we would have to sit in between his legs. When I was made to sit in between his legs, he had my backside right up against his groin. Mrs San Lance would then move his legs in and out and up and down at the same time. He also moved his hips back, back and f front and back. He would pick different girls every day to sit between his legs and to rub his legs. Sometimes when we were made to sit between Mr Sandlands's legs, he would undo the zips on our school dresses. Our school dresses were green, white, yellow, checked with a big collar. The zip on the dress was underneath the right-hand side, came right down to the hip. Mm -hmm. To unzip the dress, you had to pull the zip downwards. The dress also had buttons down on her waist. Mr Sandlands would unzip the dress and then put his hands inside the dress. He would then rub my breasts and stomach. I told him to stop a few times, but he didn't. He would do this in front of everyone. Even though Mr Sandlance would not let me go to sports classes, I was made to get changed anyway. Mr Sandlance used to send the boys to the toilets to get changed, but the girls had to get changed in the classroom in front of him. The girls always tried to find some, something to change behind, like a table, chairs or something that would give them some cover. Mr Sandlance was not my teacher after Mr Sandlance was not my teacher after grade three, but continued to physically and sexually abuse me during lunch times and when he could find me outside the classes. He would also call me out of my of my other classes. I'm not sure exactly when the abuse stopped but I believe it was towards the end of grade five. At, this, at that time, I got a, a new teacher who seemed a bit more curious about Mr Sandlance as I got older. I also became more aware of places in the school where I could go and hide, where I could, yeah, or, yeah, or unlikely, sorry, I just, yeah, unlikely for Mr Sandlance to find me. Mr Sandlance retired when I was in year seven or year eight, and I remember the assembly that was held for him at the school. The, stu the students were told that Mr Sandlance was leaving because he was legally blind and couldn't teach anymore. At the start, at the start of one of my school holidays, my friend AGB and I had attended the school church on a Sunday. Miss Anne Brown, Mrs Brown, councillor, who was the teacher at that time, was also at the church. I can't, I can't recall exactly when it was on this day. Whilst we were all, while we were all at the church, I said to Miss Brown, I wanted to talk to her about Mr. Sandlance and he was what he was doing to me. She agreed, and after church, we recall she drove HEB and and me to a park. I told Miss Brown that Mr. Sandlance has been doing 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 to me. I described how he, how he would unzip the side of my dress and put his hands inside, inside the dress. 
on my breasts and my stomach. I described how he would hit me on the bare buttocks with a wooden paddle. I, to I told her that he would often tell me obscene stories and make me say that they were true. Upon hearing what I had to say, Miss Brown said words to the following effect, Mr Sandlant should be fired for what he is doing. The school knows what he is like and are looking into it. Miss Brown said that they shouldn't, they shouldn't say anything to anyone about what I had told her. I heard no more about the matter until some time in grade two, AGB a, and I were called out of the class to a meeting in the old computer room in the church. We were told to sit down at a large table. There were seven or eight, eight other people around the table, Pastor Smith, um, who was the school board, <coughs> and Mr Rooks and Miss Brown, who were present. I told them that Mrs Sandlance had been doing to me AGB, told them what he used to... <sighs> AGB told them what he, he had been doing to her. I did not have a specific regulation of what anybody said at the meeting, either to a AGB or myself. To the best of my recollection, I can recall someone said to the words to the effect, he will get fired and he won't be your teacher anymore. Yeah, right. So, um, <laughs> I recall at the meeting I was, I was told not to tell anyone about Mrs Sam Lance had done and some and someone said we will deal with it. I recall asking I recall asking if I could change to another teacher. I was told no. I told them I didn't want to be Mr. Sandalance's club the following year. After the meeting I made further complaints about Mr. Sandalance what was doing to me. Normally I made them to Mrs. Brown. I would go and see her in the office near the school oval and would tell her that Mr. Sandalance <coughs> was still doing those things to me. Mrs Brown would respond by saying these things to the effect of, don't worry, it's okay, don't say anything to anyone, I'll talk you through it with other people and we'll deal with it. I recall there was at least one occasion where I went to see Mr Rooks in his office with Miss Brown. I can't recall whether I said anything to Mr Mr Rooks, but I recall Miss Brown told Mr Rooks what I had told her that that is that Mr Sandlands was still I don't know that indecently assaulting indecently assaulting me. Thank you, Mr Mr Rook Mr Rooks said words to the effect of I will look into it and I won't have I won't have Mr Sandlands as a teacher if he is doing what he is. What he is... Oh, religion. Oh, religion. Thank you. I then made further reports and complaints to Miss Brown about what was continued to occur between Mr Sandlance and myself. I either saw Miss Brown in her office or in the church or in the office by the Oval when I made these further complaints. During the meetings that I had after... What had ha During the meetings that I had about what was happening, I recall being told, your mum has been contacted, but she, but she couldn't make it. At the time, I assumed that my mum was aware of all the meetings, but, but didn't want to be involved. We didn't talk about it at home. It wasn't until later, when I was making my statement with the police, that I found out that my mother had no... I had not been told by the school about my complaints. I recall at the start of grade three when I realised I still had Mr Sandlance as my teacher. I went crying to either Mr Rooks and Mrs Fell and a grade four teacher at the school. I recall I was upset, but I couldn't recall what I said. I made the further reports to Mrs Bowen during grade three. About Mr Sand... Mrs Brown during grade three about Mr Sandlance and what he was doing to me. The school did not respond to my requests of Mr Sandlance not to be my teacher. He remained my teacher in grades one, two and three. The abuse continued throughout that, throughout that time. 
In January 2000, I made a statement to the police about Mr Sandilance had done to me. A copy of the statement is marked NSC.001.005.001. .0052 and has extra details about the way Mr Sandlance abused me. He was charged with decent assault against me and a number of other students and he was convicted in 2001. The criminal justice process was a ne uh, the criminal process the, the criminal process was a negative response for me. The police officer who took my statement was unemotional and blunt. I was by myself when when she took the statement and it took about five hours. The officer told me that we were in private, but being in a glass room, I felt like there were people watching me and waiting to take questions. I did not feel at that time that I was believed and I did not feel giving this statement lifted the burden as I expected it to. The, the experience was negative for me and it made me, f ma it made me feel heavier. During the trial, I felt like I wasn't understood. The judge would not let me read my impact statement that I had written. It took my heart and my soul to write that. And when the judge said that he wouldn't read it, it felt like a kick in the gut. I was de devastated. The whole trial seemed fast and that the victims were not given an opportunity to read their statements. I recall during the trial when I gave evidence that Mr Sandilance felt my breast, the judge said to me in words to the effect, but you were only six, seven and eight. You didn't have breasts to feel. I was upset when the judge made me, made this comment and yelled something out. I yelled something out to the judge, but I couldn't remember exactly what I said. The judge said something back to me like I was going to get in trouble. I thought the judge, I thought the, the judge's comment was disgusting. Even though my breasts weren't developed, Mrs Sandlant still touched that area of my body. I just didn't appreciate the judge's comment. To the best of my recollection, Mrs Sandlant was sentenced one to one year imprisonment plus one year on parole. I didn't think this sentence was good enough. It just wasn't appropriate. <coughs> in September 2000, in, in, in September 2000, I... Initiated civil proceedings? He initiated civil proceedings in the County Court of Victoria against Mrs Sandlands, Northside Christian College, <coughs> Mr Smith and Mrs Brown. A copy of the statement is claimed, is marked NSC.001.001.0072. I believe there were 63 other children involved in criminal proceedings. Some of them were involved in the civil action against Mr Sandlance, but not sure how many. Most of them pulled out and only five went right through with the proceedings. One of those five committed suicide before the settlement happened. I found the legal proceedings extremely stressful. In one of the mediations, I collapsed. This is when my lawyer thought it was, it would be, my lawyer thought it was too much for me. During the mediation, I made it clear that I wanted a written apology for what had happened. The matter was set it out of court in November 2001. I was paid 225,000 inclusive of illegal costs. My, my legal costs were approximately 48,000. The whole, the whole process took about one year. As a part of the settlement, I had to agree to keep the matter confidential. I had to, un I understood in this, this included speaking to psycho psychologists and counsellors about the abuse. During the final day of the mediation, I was told, you can still seek out help, but you can't talk about the details of what happened. I thought, well, what's the point of going to get help? I didn't actually want the money. I wanted an apology, but I never got one. I didn't know, I didn't know if, I don't know if my request for an apology was formally indicated in the statement. I wanted the school and the people I reported it to to be accountable count for what happened. I felt like they gave me money just to keep me quiet again, but the money doesn't solve anything. They still did what they did. 
the effects, the eff the effects from the abuse that I endured as a young girl will always be a part of my life, leaving me with memories that I can never forget. I have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, depression, post-traumatic stress. I have felt angry, anxious, isolated as a result of, mis of what Mr Sandlance did to me and had, a, had difficulty, dif difficulty with per personal relationships. I can't trust people because I'm scared. I've got a son and he goes to his crèche and I'm even scared with them. As a young girl, I believe going to school should have been an enjoyable time with the trust of the teachers to help me guide me through along. These, criti these criti critical years are the ones that form the foundation for a healthy education future. However, for me, a six-year-old girl going to school was the scariest thing and made me very afraid of the, uh, afraid of the older people around me. Going to school affected me it affected me each and every day I lived with. Going to school affected me each and every day and I lived with an ongoing fear of not, not knowing what was going to occur on a day-to-day -day basis. It made me feel physically sick. It made me feel physically as every day, knowing I had to see him and feeling a hopelessness that I had no control of. I put my trust in the people from the school and the church to do the right thing by me. I developed the courage to confront them and to tell them what was occurring, but the promise they made to change things year after year seemed to fail on deaf ears. The school and the people within the church destroyed my faith in the Lord and being able to go to church. After that, I couldn't compra contemplate. contemplate after that, I couldn't contemplate or believe that people who call themselves God's followers could allow this abuse to occur right underneath their eyes for so many years let in, and let, let alone cover it up. I had told so many pastors, counsellors and teachers that, that, that to this day I'm unable to... Counsellors and teachers... Can you just help me with that one, please? Yes, sorry. I had told so many pastors, counsellors and teachers that to this day I am unable to go to church because I have no trust or faith in the pastors and still feel scared. Thank you. I have tried to attend TAFE at a number of, a number of times, but I'm unable to sit in a classroom environment without the flashbacks coming back into play at full force. The anxiety and the panic attacks I suffer are so crippling that he has affected every point of my life and my future. Not being, able to not being able to learn and develop in a normal environment such as a young girl has made it incredibly difficult, difficult to manage my day-to-day -day life. The simplest things can take me much longer to do and to cope with. Today, even at my age, I struggle to read and spell, which affects me so much of what I can do in life and it, it eats away at my confidence. It keeps, it keep, it keeps... It should, be say, it should say it keeps me from doing a lot. Yeah, it keeps me from doing a lot and makes me feel like I didn't have the ability to achieve the goals that I, I set for myself. Even reading bedtime stories to my son Even reading bedtime stories to my son, it puts me down, it makes me feel low and it gives me anxiety. The low moods are the hardest to deal with day to day. They are so suffocating. There is not one day that goes by that doesn't remind me about what happened. Even getting justice to the, to the law was poorly handled and I felt let down by them. <laughs> Excuse me. The abuse by Mr Sandlance. <clears throat> has had a big effect on my life. People say you learn to overcome it, come overcome your past, but I believe you can't. It makes you who you are. Thank you. The end. <laughs> Thank you. I have uh, just some very brief comment, uh, sorry, questions to ask you. Yes. Uh, you referred to 
in your statement um, the criminal proceedings yes. took place, and that was in um, in 2000 and 2001. Yes. Um, and you mentioned there, I think at paragraph 38, you believe that there were 63 other students involved in the criminal proceedings. Yes. Um, who who told you about uh, that number? Who My gave lawyer. you that information? My lawyer. Your lawyer. All right. Um, there were 63 ch children who made complaints. A lot of them ended up doing statements, um, but a lot of them pulled out due to um, well, some of the kids... I can't mention names, but some of the kids' fathers were on the board, etc., like that. So they weren't allowed to continue to go on. All right, so that's information that you obtained from your lawyer, who I presume had heard it from the police. Is that how it was? Um, Conveyed to I, you? Yes, I suppose, yes. yes all right. Um, now, you gave some evidence about the mediation process. Yes. Um, which occurred after the criminal proceedings. Yes. And um, um, you said uh, you were concerned, I think, uh, about your health during that process, is that right? Yes. Um, and was that related to the, the length of the mediation? It was related to the length of the mediation um, and also um, the people who came from Northside, so the committee people who came from Northside, how they made me feel at that committee. Did you, did you meet those people at the mediation? Um, no, they were in another room. They did have a Bible meeting before they entered into the room outside the front. But did you see that? Or? I did see that. I officially saw that. They were holding their Bibles. How long did the um, mediation go on for? Five days. Um, and where was it held? Um, it was going to be at the county court, but media got a hold of it. Northside didn't want Northside Christian College and Northside Christian Centre didn't want the media release all to be at the county court. The, the 24 hours before it was to start, it got moved to another building. All right. Um, it was just an office building somewhere, wasn't it? Was it was an office building. All right. And um, you referred to there as not being sure about whether an apology was part of the uh, settlement. Uh, just let me ask you a question about that. Have you ever received a, an apology from... Nothing. Have you ever received a, a written apology? No. Um, have you received any apology from uh, Dennis Smith? No. Have you received an apology from John Spinella? No. Would you still like an apology? Yes. And I would like an acknowledgement. Not just a sorry, I want an acknowledgement. Thank you, Liz. Those are my questions. Your Honour. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Fredden, I'm not sure whether or not you've had the opportunity to watch what's been going on in here and we've obviously had some exposure to a court-like process. So yes. what I'm about to do now is ask the other representatives of various parties who are sitting here at the tables in the hearing room as to whether yes. or not they have any questions for you. Yes. You OK? Right. You ready yep. for that? Yep. So I'll let Ms McGlinchey go last because Ms McGlinchey here is the legal representative for you. OK. Mr Kernigan. Thank you. No. Um, uh, in fact, probably you want to go last, Mr Pratt. I'm sorry about that. Oh, you're on. No, no, I think that it might be... Ms oh. McGlinchy is representing uh, the witness. this witness. And yeah. Mr Pratt is for uh, Mr Smith. Yes, yes. I've just realised. Sorry, I've got that round the wrong way. Um, do you want to go I next? Think, does Mr Pratt... I do have a question too. Yes, go on. Ms Bretton. Yes. At paragraph 23 of your statement, you talk about... You just introduce yourself, Stop. please. Ms. Fred, my name is Mr. Pratt. I represent Reverend or Pastor Smith, as you refer to him. Sorry, what company are you from? I'm from uh, a firm called Gil Shannon and Luton in Brisbane. At paragraph 23 of your statement, you talk about a meeting that was held at the old computer room of the church. Yes. You're saying that there were seven or eight people at that meeting, including Mrs Brown. Yes. And you say that Pastor Smith was there. Yes. Right. Can I ask if you're 100 per cent certain that Pastor Smith was there? I'm 100 per cent certain. Can I put it to you that he wasn't there? 
Pardon? Can I put it to you that he wasn't there on that occasion? Who? Pastor Smith. No, he was. Okay. Um, he was there at every committee meeting that I had. At every committee meeting? Yes. There was a couple of committee meetings. There wasn't just one. There was quite a several, several amount where I had to go up into the church and all the men would be sitting around the table and I'd walk in with sometimes a GB um, and other times by myself. But there was quite a few meetings with them and that was the whole committee of the board of the church. So are you talking about the school board? I'm talking about the church board and the school board. Look, they were interlinked back then. Yes. Yes. The meeting you mentioned in paragraph 23, mm. is that the first meeting that you had it was with the committee? I can't recall exactly if that was the first one or not. It was one of the meetings that you had? One of many. Of many. Of many. There were several and they would write a lot of documents down and they would keep them up. In the computer room, there would be a little room on the side. Um, there was a telephone in there. They would say to me that they would go and ring my mother. Um, I would actually even hear them pretending to talk to my mother on the phone. I could hear Dennis Smith talking to my mother. It was She was not on the phone. Um, after all the meetings would, occur, would finish, there was a stairs, what you could pull down to the roof, and they would keep all their files up in the roof. And my lawyer did find them up in the roof, exactly where I did tell my lawyer to find them. All right. Thank you. I have nothing further. Okay. Yes, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chowdhury. Just Mr. one Woods. issue. Uh, Ms Fred, my name is, uh, my surname's Woods. I'm a lawyer representing uh, Northside Christian Church and Northside Christian College. I just want to ask you about one issue yes. that Mr Beckett um, took you to, yes, uh, and it's in relation to paragraph uh, 38 of your statement and that number of 63. I just need to give you some background as to why I'm asking the question. Yeah. Um, the Royal Commission... What number, a, sorry? Sorry, pa paragraph 38, yeah. and you'll see just in the first line there, it's, a, it's the first issue that yeah. um, Mr Becker took you to, yeah. um, and I understand what you've said um, in answer to his questions. Just by way of background, the Royal Commission has asked both the college and the church to provide all of the documents that they've got in relation to various issues, including um, the documents in relation to criminal proceedings. Yes. They've got a document that I'll get a copy handed up to you, which has it's entitled a charge and summons against Mr Sanderlands. Um, it's only just been identified for the Commissioner's sake. We just got um, Ms Fretton's statement last night and so I just this issue really arose then, which is why I haven't asked for it to be put in the tender bundle beforehand. But Ms Fretton, um, the charge and summons against Mr Sandilands is the information that my client has had um, to go on about what criminal charges were made against Mr Sandilands. And it has... Uh, a total of 11 charges that relate to six students, including you. Mm -hmm. um, because the, all the... Sorry? Well, this, I, I think you're going to answer the question I'm going to ask. Because all the kids had to pull out. Yes. And because so, the school has got that much control. Even if you leave the school, the school controls you. You can't. If their parents say no, you can't. The school's like a cult. Can, can I understand, then, that... Um, is it, is it correct in your understanding that, and I understand that you say that there were m many more students, but mm. is it correct in your understanding that there were 11 criminal charges against Mr Sanderlands that related to six students? Yes, and a lot of charges got dropped. Yes, I understand. Um, oh, when you say charges got dropped, um, again, I've only got this document to go by that has 11 charges in it. Are you aware of what charges were Your Honor, I might just uh, I might just interrupt. I don't think there's any dispute really about um, when this particular issue. We know how many charges there were. We know the number of students um, that are involved. Um, I really don't want. I don't think there is much um, assistance provided to the Royal Commission by evidence concerning what happened during the the police investigation. We don't have that very detailed material we haven't uh, we don't have a statement from the the detectives concerned or other police officers that may be able to assist with what would be a very difficult and long um, mm. 
and, and in fact, that's really the point that I'm making, uh, Commissioners, that uh, there is the historical documents and there's um, obviously Ms Fretton's memory of the situation. There was some ambiguity from um, certainly my point of view when I read um, Ms Fretton's statement and looked at the material and I was just wanting to ask those questions, but I've asked all I want to now, right. so I'm happy to leave it there. Thank you, Ms Fretton. No problem. Ms McGlinchey. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms Fretton, uh, for the benefit of the people who are watching, I announce that my name is Ms McGlinchey and I'm uh, representing you, Emma Fretton. Right. Uh, uh, Emma, um, you've waited a great deal, a very <coughs> long time to, to tell your story. A very long time. And to be listened to. Yes. To and it's very important to you that you're being listened to. Yes. Because right. you weren't listened to at school. No, all the court proceedings, all the civil proceedings. All right. Now, you've already you've, um, said that you found the criminal proceedings very disappointing for you, a negative experience? Very negative. All right. And you've said you weren't allowed to read your victim impact statement? Um, no, the judge wouldn't let me read my impact statement because she said it was unnecessary. Uh, now, prior to that, had you expected to read your victim impact yes, statement? Yes, I got told to write one, so I took my, all my energy and my soul, yeah, all my feelings were on that. And then, yeah, she just said no. And was it just you who couldn't read the victim impact statement or the others as well? I think it was the others too. I'm not 100% sure, but I was the only one who actually went to the court day on that day. Right. Were you given any reason? She just said it was unnecessary. And it was obviously very disappointing for you. Oh, very disappointing. Right. Because that's well, the way how a victim, you know, says to a judge of what happens, their feelings, their own way of their story, and her not hearing that, or other people hearing that, they really didn't get to hear the actual impact of what occurred. I just want to ask you a few questions about the civil proceedings. Yes. Um, you didn't initially start the proceedings with the view of getting a financial payout. No. What did you hope to achieve by I did not proceedings? Want, I did not want to pay out at all. Um, what I wanted was the people, not only the perpetrator or the abuser, as Mr Sandlance, but I wanted the other people, Mr Smith, Spinella, um, Mrs Brown, Mrs Fairlong, to take a call to what they have done also. I feel they're, they're about as responsible as Mrs. Mr. Sandlance. They're the ones who let it occur for so many years. They're the ones who allowed it to occur after so many complaints. And you wanted them to recognise their failings? I recognise their failings, but not just say I recognise it. I want, they need to actually acknowledge it, not allege, not alleging. They know what had occurred. And the apology you were seeking, what did you hope would be in the apology? Not just as an apology, acknowledgement, not only for me, but for ever, all those other girls and boys. An acknowledgement, what they know. A sorry, anyone can say a sorry, but I actually want an acknowledgement that the school admits to, to their wrongdoing, that the church admits to their wrongdoing. And I believe, or I feel, like the people in those positions ultimate names that I had mentioned prior should not be able to have their um, teacher roles or pastor roles or councillor roles. So that's what I expected out of the, the civil sin. That's what I thought what would happen. I didn't want the money side of it. I just wanted them to be accountable for what they heard and didn't do about it. Thank that you. makes sense. <laughs> it does. Thank you, Emma. That's okay. Thank you. Mr Beckett, any, any other matters that you had no, for nothing Ms Fredden? Ms Fredden, I, I wonder if I can just ask you a couple of questions, of really course. just by way of clarification. Yes. Um, I, I, I was going to ask you about what you meant when you said that you wanted an acknowledgement, but yeah. Ms. Uh, Ms. McGlinchey's assisted with okay. that. Yes. But let me, can I just tell you what I, what I 
now understand, and you yes. tell me if we've understood this correctly, okay. that an acknowledgement for you means a full statement from the church and those in positions of authority at the time that you were being abused. Yes. A full statement that acknowledges in in clear language what happened. Yes. That it was and that it was wrong. Yes. And that it was a fa a failing of those who yes. who, who should have Yes. Uh, been doing something different. Yes. And I want them to actually say, yes, I did wrong. Yes, I didn't follow those complaints up. Yes, I let it go on for so long. Okay. So that, that's, um, as I said, I was assisted by Ms yeah. McGlinchey asking you those questions. So that's what you mean. And you, you, you draw a distinction between an apology and an acknowledgement. Is that right? Um, well, I feel a sorry. Anyone can say sorry. You go past someone in the corridor and you say sorry. And I believe, coming from Northside Christian College or Northside Christian Centre, their sorry is not good enough. They will always try and hide behind it, so I want a full acknowledgement. I see. Now, just one, one other thing I wanted to ask you about. It was just a, a detail of um, something that you were saying about yes. that period of the mediation. Yes. So when you were going backwards and forwards, this is now during the during the civil yes. okay. um, part of the legal proceedings. Okay. Um, you, you you made a reference to um, people from Northside being there and how they made you feel. Yes. Um, are you able to just explain that a little bit, a little bit more about what happened during that process for you and how that made you feel? The whole process on five days, or yeah, no, I'm yeah. just referring to your comment about um, the the you were talking about the committee people from Northside when they were outside having their little church meeting. Or, yes, that was yes. the reference that you made. Um, I just felt like they were using God as, an, God as a way, trying to cover behind the Bibles and trying to make themselves look good, reading, having a little meeting outside with their Bibles, reading a couple paragraphs and then having a prayer meeting. I thought it was all on show. Really, it really wasn't appropriate. Um, oh, wow. Well. They disgust me. I see. So that's what you meant. Thank you. Yeah. So is there anything arising out of that for anyone? No, Your Honour, the only issue is the document that I referred to a moment ago. I'd ask that that's tendered and included in the tender bundle, but I should note it hasn't been redacted yet because it's just come out of the yes. summons documents. That's exactly what I was going to, to say, that we do intend to, that I do intend to tender it, but it does need to be redacted before I do. So I will that on mark it as um, Exhibit 18.0015. I'm sorry to do this um, with you sitting in the box. No, but, that's fine. Um, 18.0015. Um, that's the. Um, these were the. Yes, it's the charge the and summons with and summons. Um, with respect to Kenneth Sandlands. Um, I'm just. So it's the original charge and summons, obviously not not yes. ultimately the um, presentment. Signed by the registrar on the 17th of yeah. July, 2000. Thank you. <coughs> so Mr Beckett, um, otherwise, you have no further questions. Yes, I have no further questions. Ms. Thank Fretton. you, Ron. Ms. Fretton, thank you for thank you. Um, your attendance Probably and so. you're, you're otherwise excused. So that thank means you. Um, you can stay yeah. seated in the hearing room if you, if you wish to, although I think... Um, Probably that completes the evidence for today, does it? Yes, yeah, save for um, some documents I'm All just right. about to tender. But otherwise, you know that we resume at 10 a.m. on Monday. No problem. Thank you. I'll be there.
She can take a seat. Thank you. So, Your Honour, just some um, documentation with respect to Northside. The, um, the first bundle of documents with respect to Northside Christian Centre Incorporated and related entities um, is contained in a volume that was being provided to the parties. Um, I think it's best that I tender that by itself. Yes, 18.0016. And there is a, a supplementary tender bundle which has been compiled as a result of discussions between the Royal Commission and those who Mr. Mr. Woods represents. So I apologise. I just uh, for a moment. I tender the a supplementary tender bundle of um, north side documents as well. Right. 18.0017. Yes, that concludes uh, evidence for today. Mr Kernan wishes, just before we wind up for today, to seek leave to appear for um, Ms Lovell, as I understand. I've been recently instructed to act for Ms Lovell and uh, I haven't been able to put in the ordinary application, so I'll seek that leave now, if I may have it. Yes. Um, no one wants to say anything about that application, Mr Beck? No, it's not opposed. All right. Um, in, in those circumstances, uh, leave's granted. Thank you. Ms. Kernan. Are you able to just go through the order of witnesses commencing on Monday morning, Mr Peck? Yes. Um, the first witness will be uh, Ms Furlong, who is a teacher at Northside Christian College. And uh, then Ms Lovell, who was also a teacher at the school at that, at that time and also uh, worked as a part-time counsellor at the school. Uh, she will be followed by uh, Mr Simon Murray, who was the deputy principal towards the end of Mr Sanderland's time at uh, Northside Christian College. And then we expect to hear evidence from Dennis Smith, who was the senior pastor of Northside Christian Centre, uh, which is now Encompass Church. Um, and then, although I don't expect we will get to them until um, Tuesday, um, John Spinella, who's currently the senior pastor at Encompass Church, um, but was at Northside Christian Centre um, and involved with the school from 1992. And then finally, um, the, the current officer of the, sorry, the current state officer of Australian Christian churches from Victoria. Um, now, that uh, witnesses is under active consideration. There may be that there are some revisions to that, um, but that's uh, something that will be actively considered over the weekend. Thank you. Right. If there's nothing further, um, we'll otherwise adjourn until 10 on Monday. Is your honour, please? All stand.